frozen. I think I've frozen. Yeah. I've frozen my hair. I'm, I got booted out. Okay. Good afternoon, commissioners, members of our audience. Do we have any? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's uh, Patricia Diefendorfer, chief planner with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I just wanted to um, kind of call us to order and. Um, get the meeting started. Is everyone ready to do that? All right, great. Um, wanted to prov provide a very quick overview of the agenda today. I think you all saw uh, the agenda, but essentially um, we are going to do an election of officers. We're gonna have um, a, a number of uh, different training modules related, kind of completing the training that we started um, two weeks ago at the retreat but didn't quite finish. Um, we're going to have one of our staff, um, GIS folks, join the meeting to provide a map app training just to uh, help the commission learn how to read public testimony. Welcome. Um, we're going to provide, uh, another staff person is going to provide a um, overview of the statewide planning goals and the comprehensive plan. Um, I'm going to provide a little uh, few slides on kind of the ecosystem of implementing the comprehensive plan. Sandra will go over, um, provide a zoning code overview, and then we'll go into the, uh, the one item of business, which is the parking project. I believe you all received a, um, uh, the package for the parking code amendments, and we'll, we'll provide, staff will be providing an overview of that project in preparation for um, a hearing next at the next meeting. So that's an, just a high level overview of the agenda. And I wanted to um, just uh, start by asking for any items of interest from the commissioners, if anyone has any items they wanna update the, the rest of the commission on. No, no items? Okay. All right, very good. Um, so with that, we typically do the director's report. Um, at this point, I don't have any items to report uh, um, at this time, but that is a standing item and I'll, it's an opportunity for me to share some information with the commissioners um, in, in that space. So I'll be doing that in the future. Um, so with that, I wanted to go ahead and um, if there are no other questions or comments, wanted to go ahead and sort of kick off the discussion about the election of officers, okay? Um, so as, as you all know, because this is a new commission, we do not have an existing chair who would normally preside over the meeting. Um, and so I'm sort of performing that function for the moment. And I wanted to just provide some background and context to open up this item of, for discussion. Uh, so one, one of the things I wanted to share is that the, the zoning code language that establishes the Planning Commission outlines its powers and duties, as you know, as we covered last, uh, in the last meeting, but it does not speak to elections and officers very much, other than to say that the election of officers takes place at the first meeting of the calendar year. Typically, bylaws provide more detail about the number of officers, the role of the officers, and the length and number of terms. Um, as this is a new body, this commission, this commission does not yet have bylaws. Uh, that will be a task um, of the next and subsequent meetings. We will engage in a conversation together about um, developing the bylaws. However, um, if we look to the former Planning and Sustainability Commission structure for guidance, uh, the, that, that commission had a, one chair and two vice chairs. Um, and I think you'll probably hear from those uh, members of our commission that are former uh, PSC members, they can probably share their observations about um, 
that model and the experience with that model, but I think that there's probably somewhat general agreement that that was a, a good model. It ensured um, kind of a, a depth of leadership. It created a system where new leaders can learn from existing leaders and it enabled a sharing of the duties and responsibilities of the officers. Um, so I also wanted to quickly share a little bit about the role of the officers, just so everyone has a common understanding about uh, what the chair and the vice chairs um, typically, what those functions are. Um, so the chair provide, presides over the commission meeting and generally runs the commission meetings, guiding um, you know, deliberations, uh, kind of making sure that we're, it, the deliberations are done in sort of with order, order and decorum and establishes time limits for uh, the public testimony. The chair and vice chairs also have additional time commitments um, in the form of uh, twice monthly officer meetings um, that uh, along with staff which are used to prepare for the upcoming commission meetings. Um, the officers, uh, often the chair but also uh, the vice chairs depending on availability, uh, attend city council hearings on items that were before the commission to help present the recommendation of the planning commission to the city council. Uh, the vice chairs also serve as acting chair in the absence of the chair. Um, so just one last bit of information I kind of want to share with you as you start to have a discussion about elections. Um, in thinking about whether you yourself are interested in serving as chair or vice chair or you're considering um, nominations for chair and vice chair, you may want to consider uh, what qualities are desirable in a chair and vice chair, uh, what relevant experience would be desirable, is it legislative, you know, knowledge of legislative procedure, running meetings, policy, expertise, other. Um, the candidate's capacity to take on the additional duties and time commitments required of these officer positions and um, the flexibility of their schedules to accommodate these daytime meetings and city council meetings. So that really concludes, I just wanted to give everyone kind of a basic understanding of what the roles are, what the time commitments are, and what it entails. And with that, I would just like to open it up to the commission for discussion. Eli, I, I see your hand up. Eli? Yeah, I'm, I'm Rod. Hi, everyone. I'm in Haines, Oregon, on spring break. Um, I guess. I would love to have a, to hear a go around of people just expressing where people are on this, whether there's excitement to be serving officer, no way, hell no, I'm gonna do it, no way, um, maybe later or if needed, that kind of thing. And, and maybe someone who's actually in person there could facilitate, because after that we could just do a little brainstorming as a group to figure out who we wanna be as officer. And I like the idea of having a chair and two vice chairs. I mean, we're not stuck with that, but I, I kind of agree that makes sense. So um, I, will, I will model this by saying that I have served in those roles and I'm happy to have other people do it um, and leave it at that for me. Thank you, Eli. There's a, there's a power, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I forgot go. to tell, tell you all that you have to, yes, you're gonna speak into the, the microphones and there's a button you just have to push. Do you wanna make sure you- I have to hold the, the button? No, you oh, don't have okay. to hold it. All right. Are you um, speaking to the mic? Am I speaking? Can you hear me? Okay, already. Um, so um, I am open. Um, I'm open to it, but um, I I do question my capacity, um, and um, I kind of already have said that if if no one else is willing, <laughs> then I will rise to the occasion. But um, I just wanted to put that out there. So um, yeah. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I am interested in a vice chair position, um, but I'm also interested to hear if other people, if there's overwhelming interest, I feel like I could step aside and maybe nominate someone else, but I'm also um, happy to do it. I think I served as vice chair for just the one year, or yeah, most of a year, but about half of that year was spent dissolving um, the the PSC. So maybe it's more accurately described as like a half a year of experience. And I would just say from 
my personal experience, much like other uh, planning commission um, workloads, it just really varies based on the agenda, how much of an extra lift it is. There is the standing meeting traditionally that we've done that Patricia mentioned that is usually held, I think it's like 10 days or it's, you know, about a week and a half before the next meeting to um, review with staff the, the presentation and plans and flow of meeting. And if um, there are other uh, members of the commission that want to sit in on that, that's also an opportunity for people to like see the, the officer side of things without being an officer as long as we are below quorum. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, it's just playing more of a support role to the chair. And so then it, it depends a little bit on their bandwidth or capacity or if they're out of town when something is going to city council or if I think at one point there was not a potential conflict of interest, but like enough blurriness that maybe it was Eli at the time was like, okay, I'll step aside on this whole um, code update. And I think it was... Um, RIP to the residential infill project too. And so then the vice chair ran that portion of every meeting and um, went to city council. So there was a little bit more workload, um, but just my own and others should, should provide their perceptions of this, but my own perception is that the vice chair is maybe a little bit more work, but chairing is like kind of a big, you know, step up, especially because I'm like the type of person that, um, I just don't do great on the fly. So I always feel like I want to prepare and stuff. And I maybe we've had other chairs in the in the past that are just like fly by the seat of their pants and kill it that way. But I'm not that person. So I know that for me, it would be like a lot extra. Um, I am interested maybe in being chair at some point in the future, but just with a little newborn on the way um, in a couple months, I think it's too much for me right now. So that's where I'm at. And if other people have questions or anything, happy to answer. Mary Rain, I, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you so much, Patricia. Hello, everyone. I am in Santa Monica for spring break. So you see some sunshine coming through uh, here. So um, really appreciate everyone that has spoken and um, you know has shared experience and perspective. I have interest in chair and vice chair. So I'm also interested to hear the rest of the commissioners in terms of interest. Um, in terms of uh, either opportunity really, um, but understanding that the chair is a commitment. Um, I do have experience running public meetings while I am a, a new uh, planning commissioner. Um, I feel somewhat comfortable jumping into that role and know that there's great support from the staff and other commissioners here. Um, I also have great support from my um, workplace, Central City Concern, in, in doing this work. So I think that in terms of um, a little extra time commitment, that would be supported um, for my participation at that level. So um, wanted to express my interest, but certainly I'm looking forward to hearing from the other commissioners. Um, Mary Rain, that sounds great. Uh... Thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, I have served as chair for one year and vice chair for two years. Um, the idea of just coming and reading testimony and participating feels like a dessert that I haven't had in a long time. So um, Michael, just in case you wanted to be vice chair, I would bring you snacks in support. Query <laughs> um, <laughs> them to your house. Uh, that is a service I provide. So, and I'll just mention, um, and I really appreciate Erica. Um, that was a great overview of officers meeting, et cetera. And, and I will say, because we've done hybrid meetings, it's harder to see um, who people are. So um, one thing that is a has been a norm at the PSC is uh, for um, uh, the, whoever is uh, vice chair or chair in the room to say, who is um, who is in the room physically? And so Michael Pouncil, uh, it's Pouncil, yeah. Uh, Erica Thompson, Steph Routh, Michael Alexander, Nikesh Patel. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, and so we are who is in um, in person. And one addition, I don't know if you had mentioned. Um, it is occasional that uh, the vice chair, because part of it is to build a deep bench of. Uh, 
of folks who can um, who have the ability to uh, and the experience to um, to preside over specific projects, even if it's not. So that's that's another option that we can consider, perhaps in bylaws, that it doesn't have to be always the chair or a vice chair, that it can also be someone else who has a, a, a strong interest. So um, thank you very much. That was long-winded. I, I, I'm, I, I'm delighted to hear of the interest from um, individuals who have served in this iteration and a previous iteration. Um, in, in some ways, I think I shared with you that the, the space and the places that this commission will look to will be a learning experience for me. And, I, and I'm a little hesitant about the blind leading the sighted, um, you know, just in terms of, I think, the experience that is currently within this body. So I think for me, a part of it was making sure to have the capacity to meet the responsibilities as defined and then learning, you know, what it is that I don't know that hopefully I'll be able to sort of bring a deeper and, and um, more knowledgeable uh, lens to going forward. So again, I'm, I'm delighted that the, the interest has shown and the interest from folks who have done the work um, so that it's an informed um, indication of desire so I um, I support it and um, will look for ways in which I can learn from it thanks Michael uh, and I also like to echo um, it's good good to see and hear um, a good amount of, of, of folks being interested in serving an officer position um, I um, personally um, with limited bandwidth to take on additional an additional commitment I'm not um, uh, seeking an officer position at this time but uh, perhaps down the road um, but uh, it just all things with wedding planning uh, this year and um, ongoing uh, commitments I would um, I, I wouldn't want to take on an immediate officer position um, and also another um, reason is um, I haven't served on a public uh, commission before and before immediately jumping into an officer position I'd like to first get some exposure and experience to the public meeting process um, firsthand and so that's out of my uh, position but it, it seems like we have um, a decent amount of interest for both vice chair and chair. Mary Rain expressed her interest in, uh, in the chair position. And then, um, well, Michael, Michael, Michael and Erica. And Erica as vice chair. Um, is there uh, anyone else that's, did I get that wrong? Huh? <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, what we can what we can do is, um, we uh, we if we have a nomination um, for each position and everyone's um, okay with that, uh, we can make a motion or further deliberate and continue, um, and it it doesn't have to all. Um, be decided on this meeting. We can have the de deliberation carry over to the next meeting, um, but I'd first like to get a sense of, uh, you know, of what people are thinking about and put it up for discussion for any for making any decision. Then. Uh, Presumably, we would close the nominations process if uh, everyone consents and is okay with um, uh, the folks that are interested in the two available vice chair positions and the one available chair position. Oh, it looks like Eli. Yeah. And then, and did you have your hand up? Or well, you I was just going to, to, you know, I so there's um, uh, Mary Rain, yourself, yeah. and. Uh, for chair, is that who we're looking for? Is that 
still an open position or was Eli going to take that position again? I, th I think, well, I think Mary Rain suggested she'd be open to chair or vice chair. And I was going to just ask a quick follow-up question. Mary Rain, are you comfortable stepping into that like at this moment or was that looking ahead into the future a little bit? In other words, would you feel good and confident and great about becoming chair if that was to be the motion and the direction that we moved in? Looking at the agenda, it seems like there would be one motion and hopefully I wouldn't blunder through that. Um, so I'm comfortable if if nominated and elected stepping into the chair position as of this meeting. Um, and I think that that um, I, I would also bring forward nominations for vice chairs, but I'd like to pause and um, give Eli uh, his opportunity since your hand was raised. Um, well, I think what I'm hearing is a sweet sounds great to me. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, if I mean, I, I came into this meeting thinking maybe we could hook Steph into being chair for a few months, um, but Steph seems kind of excited to um, listen and, and not have the role. So um, the, the only apprehension I have is that um, if Mary Rand, if you become chair here and um, it seems like Eric is going to have a baby and Michael might get slammed. I mean, I just I don't want you to be like stuck without support from vice chairs. So as long as um, I think that that I would support this little trio that sort of we're talking about um, just with the caveat that if 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 it ends up being that um, you end up being like the sole officer effectively because people get really busy um, or parenting, mm -hmm. then um, you, we, you would bring it back up to us and see if there's additional support and maybe there's important ways people support that, that's but other than that I, I like what i'm hearing yeah that sounds great thanks for bringing that forward eli yeah it sounds like we might be ready for a formal motion yeah can i make a formal motion um is this okay mm -hmm. vice chair vice chair um, I, I will rise to the occasion for vice chair. <laughs> what are your favorite snacks? <laughs> uh, um, well, I would love to move uh, Mary Rain um, to as chair and uh, Erica and Michael Pouncil as vice chairs. Is there a second? Second. Okay, I think we'll take a vote. Yeah, so um, again, since we haven't met as a full commission yet, um, the voting process um, is that I will call the roll um, by last name. So good, bad, or otherwise, we will always start with Commissioner Alexander. Aye. Um, Omera. Aye. Patel. Aye. Council. Aye. Spivak. Aye. Except I missed Steph. Routh. <laughs> Aye. Thompson. Yes. And I would just add, I think that as we look ahead to the, the bylaw process and creating um, bylaws for this new body, I really like the idea of um, baking in some flexibility with how um, leadership can be handled to account for some unforeseen circumstances that sometimes come up or also the specific interest that some commissioners might have in dipping their toe in or leading a certain topic without formally stepping into a role. Thank you so much, commissioners. We appreciate that. So I, I guess we could hand the meeting over to our new, if you're, if you're ready, uh, Commissioner O'Mara. If you're not, I'm happy to continue to just help us stumble through today's meeting and we'll get you more ready for the next meeting. So you please just tell us what you're comfortable with. I'll jump in and we'll consider okay. it a test run and okay. please just, if Very. I'm wondering, just call it out. Um, very Congratulations good. to the vice chairs and uh, thank you all for your confidence in electing me as, as the new chair of this commission. So excited for this work. Um, so the next item up is the consent agenda. And it looks like the only item is the consideration of the minutes from the March 14th planning commission. That's so um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, I so move, Steph. Second. I'll second. 
And then do I call the roll or do you help with that, Julie? Yeah, so um, Mary Rain, so the consent agenda is typically done just by an I and nay vote. Um, and then just more generally, I will typically call roll for other votes. So this one you can ask all in favor and we can go from there. Perfect. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes, aye. I believe that's unanimous. Motion passes. Okay, next up is the training. All right, uh, Commissioner or Chair Amara, I, I will just go ahead and introduce, um, let me remind myself who's up first. I believe that it is Sandra, right, Sandra? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Sandra Wood, our principal planner, and she'll walk us through some of the, the training materials. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Nice to see you all. I'm so excited about your first vote. Well done, <laughs> all of you. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't be that in person. I'm also on spring break from Santa Barbara. So um, Commissioner Mero, we're not too far away from each other. Um, the first thing we have on um, our training agenda, and I will share my screen so you can all take a look at this. Um, share screen. Okay, I hope you all can see that. Are we good? Okay, yes. so I'm Sandra Wood, Principal Planner at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and I'm here to continue the nuts and bolts discussion we started at the um, at the retreat two weeks ago. So I just have a few slides that we wanted to finish um, discussion about, about how the commission works. Um, and then you'll have a map app training. And when we say map app, we really mean it's a, it's a portal for the public to provide testimony. So you'll see and read all your testimony, um, written testimony through that um, map app. And we have someone from our tech services team to do that. And then we have, um, an overview of Oregon and Metro and the Portland Comprehensive Plan, which my colleague Barry Manning will provide. And then um, Patricia will talk a little bit about the ecosystem of comprehensive plan implementation, because um, this body isn't the only body that implements the comprehensive plan. And then I'll finish off with the zoning code orientation. So that's the training part of today's um, um, agenda. And then after we're done with the training, we'll go into a parking project. And that's a real project that you'll all be deliberating upon and making a recommendation at a future meeting. Um, we wanted to do this training first because it's kind of really, it's really foundational for you all to do the work for the parking project. Um, so just picking up where we left off last time, um, about how do you do your work or how do we all do this work of land use planning. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. I'll chat about the draft bylaws and then cover some logistics. Um, I shared this with you last time, but just as a refresher, there are multiple drafts of a project that um, are published. Um, the draft that comes to the commission is called the proposed draft. And that is the draft um, that the commission has a hearing about and the public is providing testimony about. And then after the commission hears testimony and makes changes, that draft is called the recommended draft that goes to city council. City council has hearings and they adopt um, um, amendments to all our tools or our policies. So we discussed that last time. We also discussed the um, typical project sequence that some of the work you all will be doing happens outside the meeting. So for example, the parking project that's on your agenda for later today, you received the staff report, um, hopefully a couple weeks ago, I think, um, and the testimony is open. There might already be testimony in the map app. Um, so you can prepare for the meeting, which is a briefing and a, a hearing at that first meeting. Um, and I won't go further into this, but it basically is like homework outside the meeting and then what occurs during the meeting itself. And we talked about that last time. Um, so who's in the meeting room? So welcome to your new meeting room. Um, 
the room was revamped and refurbished. Uh, I don't want to say like, well, I guess it was before COVID. So, um, but not too far be before COVID. Um, as you know, there are nine commissioners on the commission. Eight of them are seated right now. We have a vacancy. Um, in the past, we've had a chair and two vice chairs, and I guess we do again, which is great. Um, also around the dais is um, the BPS director's seat uh, chair, and Patricia will be most um, often the person in that chair um, if she it needs to be absent for a, a certain reason, um, then somebody else will substitute for her. Um, and then our BPS staff, Julie Oaken, will um, be at the dais also supporting the meeting. Um, there's a staff presentation table you probably see at the front there. That's where typically staff will be sitting or they might be remote like I am today. The testifiers sit at the other table and they testify, can testify in person or um, we've had obviously so many more people testify now that we're um, virtual because people can just pop into a meeting and testify. There's um, staff in the room from Open Signal. Open Signal, um, they um, record city council meetings, they record the planning commission meetings, and they broadcast it to the public. I believe we're still on channel 30 twice a week. Um, and then their recordings are the ones that are on the commission's YouTube channel. So folks are, can live view the meeting as it's happening, like as I'm speaking right now, or they can watch it later. Um, and sometimes the media will be in the room, though that's rare. Um, other ways to engage, and we um, check, sometimes this meeting, this list would be a lot longer, um, but right now it's pretty short. Um, there's ongoing participation um, required actually of the Planning Commission to sit on the Development Review Advisory Committee. That's a monthly meeting that is staffed by the Bureau of Development Services, and um, they have, I think, I don't know, 16, 18 um, positions. And one of them is reserved for a planning commission member. And Eli Spivak is already sitting on that um, seat. Um, so that's good. Um, and then there's intermittent participation that occurs with kind of ad hoc um, project teams or project work. For example, the inclusionary housing calibration study that the Bureau, um, that the Portland Housing Bureau is currently conducting um, invited the planning commission to participate in that or the planning and sustainability commission so erica is sitting on that these are the only um carry over participations we have from the old commission there certainly i'm sure will be um opportunities to participate in other types of groups as they're formed over the next you know few years draft bylaws so um um, Patricia already mentioned this today, but this is going to be one of the commission's first tasks is to adopt the bylaws. Um, the Planning and Sustainability Commission, of course, had their bylaws. They consisted of both codified language that's in the zoning code, but also additional details regarding the operation of the commission, such as um, officers and what officers um, um, are on the commission. Um, but they can get into kind of meatier issues also, and the ones that we have that we have drafted have uh, that information too, like who is the spokesperson for the commission with the media, um, how are dissenting opinions communicated both in the media or to city council. So we'll get into those discussions at your next meeting, um, and we'll send you um, a draft of those bylaws. But wanted to let you know that that's one of our first tasks. Um, to get those solidified. Um, Julie, I think you looked at the last, um, when the Planning and Sustainability Commission was formed, and it took about four months to solidify the bylaws at that time. So we don't need to be in a hurry, but but it is a task we want to we wanna get underway. Yes, Eli. Uh, just a thought on this, because I also discovered this, that um, we're basically following right now the PSC bylaws in many ways, like the agenda, public notice, decision by, we did consider by consent just now, um, which isn't even addressed in the, so I just wonder, does it make sense if it's going to take multiple months just to have some quick resolution that we're going to basically follow the, um, 
the meeting schedule, public notice agenda, and how we make decisions that are in the PSE agenda um, uh, bylaws um, as an interim process? Um, it definitely could make sense to do that. I think with this commission, we haven't sent um, a draft of the bylaws. Yeah. So how about we have that com conversation at the next meeting? Sounds good. Yeah, I'm not saying right now because no one's seen oh, okay. it except the three of us. But I'm just thinking that maybe yeah. if it's going to take multiple months to do this and we're actually adopting, uh, we're making votes on stuff, mm -hmm. it might be worth just, just having a quick just resolution we could, um, as an interim way of making our decisions and, um, um, and yeah, it, kind of like a working draft. Place. Place. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Use a working draft or something. Yeah. So yeah, let's definitely discuss that at, at the next meeting and give an, and give an opportunity for folks to read it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so a few logistics that we wanted to cover. Um, there's three ways to access information. And these are things, uh, Julie will include this in an email to you all. Um, the tentative agenda for the planning commission is updated as Julie has information and knows information. And so we work closely with staff to see when they need to get to, on to the agenda. And that's your best um, tool to see, hey, what's coming up? And should I, I'm going to be out of town that day? Is it a project I really care about? Or something like that. So um, she'll send you a link to that. I'm sure she already has actually. Um, in, in an email. So that's what we call the Planning Commission tentative agenda. The map app is something you probably want to bookmark also um, because that's where you'll be reading testimony. I personally like to read testimony when I'm on the bus. So I always have it on my phone. <laughs> and, um, and you'll get a training on that in just a second. And then we have on the um, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability project, uh, uh, um, website. There's a long range planning projects um, um, website that has all of our projects and information even before it gets to the commission when we're still in community discussion phases. A few more meeting logistics. Um, Julie Oaken is your main point of contact. We instruct staff not to be emailing commissioners directly with information so that things don't get lost. So we all funnel all of our information to Julie and she gives staff deadlines for I need the information by Thursday because I'm getting it to the commission. Um, that way we reduce the number of emails we're sending you. Um, the meeting schedule, we meet currently on the second Tuesday during the day and on the fourth Tuesday in the evening, like today from five to eight generally. We try to keep the meetings um, scheduled for about three hours. Um, when we were in person before, those got could get quite a bit longer, but when we went hybrid, uh, well, when we went um, virtual, I think everyone agreed that three hours was as long as we could be in Zoom. Um, it's a hybrid format, as you're experiencing today, some commissioners in person and some of us um, um, virtual. Um, quorum is very important. We cannot conduct a meeting, even if it's just a briefing. Like if your meeting is all just listening to briefings, um, if there isn't a quorum, and we can't call the meeting to order. So, um, well, we can we can give you more information about that, Mary Rain. But you know, there's nine commissioners. Five is a quorum. Um, in the code, we got smart last time, and we added another piece that said if um, it's the majority of the positions that are filled is the quorum number. So right now, even with eight filled, five is still a quorum because four is not a majority. Um, but if only seven were filled, it would automatically be reduced to four. Um, so that so quorum is important to start and to start the meeting and to continue conducting the meeting. So app, your absences are really important too. We totally understand you're all volunteers and this takes a lot of time. Um, but please keep your lines of communication with Julie open and she will keep track of what absences we already have planned and where we're getting close to a quorum. She will let us all know so that we can be careful and make sure we, we're conducting the city's business. Um, 
We meet as in the 1900 building um, on 1900 Southwest 4th, and there's a parking garage in the basement. We do pay for parking for planning commissioners. You are probably one of the only groups that gets um, parking paid for. Of course, we encourage you to take TriMet and we can give you TriMet passes. Um, biking is wonderful too. All the active transportation um, um, options that we have. If you need other accommodations, daycare, dietary accommodations, translation, um, please let us know. We are absolutely here to um, help you and help you participate fully on the commission. And that was all I had for finishing up our nuts and bolts about how we work together. Any questions from any of you? logistics or otherwise yes i have a question um i was uh, wondering since the um um since there's only eight of us and there should be nine is there still space to bring in an additional commissioner absolutely yeah we're planning on doing that we are um just been busy trying to onboard all of you <laughs> but the plan is to fill that vacant position Yes, uh, Patricia Diefendorfer, for the record, I just wanted to add that we absolutely plan to conduct a, a recruitment to fill that last, that last position. We just really wanted to get you all off to a good start and make sure we don't have a gap in being able to uh, conduct the business of the city. Um, so, But we will update more on that as we approach that process. Any other questions? Great, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sandra. Sure. Um, the and next... now we have, oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, and now I think Derek <laughs> is going to, um, did you know what order we were going in, sorry. You know what, I was just thinking you were so fast and that was the training and I completely forgot we have other folks lined up, so. Yes. <laughs> please help me introduce the next um, presenter presenter. It's um, Derek Miller. Derek, I see that you're here. He'll put his camera on. Derek it is um, on, on our technical services team at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, has been here a while and has created some of our best tools to um, increase um, public engagement. So I'll let Derek um, introduce himself and the tool. Hi. Uh, my name is Derek Miller. I use he, him pronouns, uh, as Sandra mentioned. Thank you, Sandra. I'm with the tech services team at BPS. I'm looking forward to giving you a quick training on the map app this evening. However, I'm not able to share my screen. So maybe Julie can give me a little bit of a hand with that. Okay, Mr. Tech, it tells me that you're a co-host, <laughs> which means you should be able to. I'm going to remove them and add them back in, so give me one second. Okay. Hopefully. Yep. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Julie. <clears throat> okay, so you are looking at what we, we refer to as the testimony reader. Um, you might also hear it referred to as the map app, um, sometimes even the public testimony platform. Um, essentially, this is our repository of public testimony that we have received uh, on BPS's various projects and proposals. <clears throat> Um, currently in this screen here, I am on the site as an anonymous user. Um, that is different than if I am signed in, which we'll get to momentarily, but you can see the difference here indicating that I'm signed in as a user. <clears throat> so as an anonymous user, um, you are presented with testimony and testimony in this system entails uh, testimony that we have received via the map app. 
It includes testimony that we have received uh, via mail, hard copy testimony. Um, it also includes uh, links to virtual testimony um, that testifiers have provided either in person at your meetings um, or virtually via Zoom. Um, initially, testimony is listed in the order it was received. Uh, there are filters here on the left-hand side. Um, this list um, is dynamic in that um, it is ordered by the amount of testimony a, a proposal is currently receiving. Um, you'll notice that uh, city budgets at the top, there was some uh, communications uh, recently about the budget, so it's it's uh, received more testimony in the recent past, so it rose to the top. Um, I believe you're soon to be discussing this parking compliance project. Um, it's only one piece of testimony, but it was recent, so again, it rises up the list. All of these links will filter the testimony list. Um, click on a piece of testimony to view that testimony. Um, as an anonymous user, you have one additional tool at your disposal, which is this star here. So you can star that piece of testimony and it will show up in your starred list. Perhaps you want to come back to it at a later time. Um, for proposals where that have received more than one piece of testimony, these navigation items will be active. So if we look at well, I'll, I'll come back to that. So that's the anonymous user experience. <clears throat> if you choose to create a portlandoregon.gov account, which is free, um, and sign into this system using that account, uh, you'll see here I'm signed in with a Gmail address, not my city address. Then you have access to a few additional tools. So if we go to, uh, this is testimony for the West Portland Town Center. Read a piece of testimony and you'll see here these navigation items, okay? Um, people who testify via the testimony submitter have the ability to attach up to three documents. If they attach a document, these documents are presented to you here in the reader. Um, you have the ability to download uh, PDF documents if you so choose, but they're also presented here for you to read in the system, <clears throat> along with the uh, text content of their testimony and the additional tools that I mentioned that you um, have access to as a what I what I call a known user. Like I know who you are because you're signed in. Um, you can make notes on a piece of testimony. These notes are specific to the user. Nobody else can see those notes, though potentially those would be subject to a public record request. I would think that's a safe assumption. Um, you also have the ability to add testimony to what we call lists. And list you can think of as uh, a file folder or a label if you're a Gmail user. And so you can see here this your list section appears because I'm a known user. So I can manage my lists. I can create one <clears throat> that becomes available for use. And so then <clears throat> as I'm reading a piece of testimony, if I want to categorize that for myself, I can add that piece of testimony to a list and then it shows up here in my list view. All right, so that's the piece of testimony that we were just looking at that I tagged as uh, assigned to my demo list. Um, many of the projects that BPS um, will bring to this commission will have a spatial component. <clears throat> if a piece of testimony is received via the map app, um, the user has two options. They can provide a general piece of testimony that is not related to a given tax lot, or they can testify when a tax lot is selected. If they testify with a tax lot selected, then you will be presented with a map to show where that piece of testimony came from. Um, and also, uh, 
any other testimony that is within an eighth of a mile of that piece of testimony. Uh, thinking here is that if there are multiple testifiers in a given area, uh, they might be related in uh, both spatially and with theme. Uh, last, I will show you um, what a piece of testimony looks like if it was virtual. <clears throat> so all of your, uh, the recordings of your meetings get uploaded to, to YouTube. Um, after a meeting, staff will provide a list of testifiers that have testified along with the timestamp of that piece of testimony. Um, a record gets entered into the database that we can link directly to uh, the video at the time when that testifier speaks. And you'll notice here if you're uh, looking uh, that we use this system for city council as well. Okay, um, that's all I have prepared and I'm gonna stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm also happy to uh, let you move on with your agenda if that's uh, what you'd like to do. Thank you, Derek. A clarifying question for me as I, I'll be learning this system. Um, is it filtering for the Planning Commission? Essentially, when we log in, we'll only be seeing testimony specific to projects and items relevant to the Planning Commission. <clears throat> That's a good question. The simple answer is no, not by default, but okay. you can do so. Um, a little bit related to the kind of process diagram that Sandra had shown, um, projects will be at the Planning Commission before they go anywhere else, right? And so uh, parking compliance is a great example. All the testimony that's received related to parking compliance while it is at the Planning Commission is going to be for the Planning Commission. As that project, or I should say, if that project moves on to City Council, then you would have a mixed list of testimony, if you will. Um, but you can also, in this sort by feature, sort by proposed draft, because proposed drafts of these proposals are what comes to the Planning Commission. So if we were to look at, let's say, West Portland Town Center, which was at, I believe it was then the PSC, later the Planning Commission, in this list of testimony for this project, there will be testimony that was at both PSC and City Council. But if I sort this list by the proposed draft, then all of this testimony for this project was at the PSC. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a question. This is Steph. Um, I've only... I've only browsed anonymously. Is there um, any, I'm just thinking in terms of public records, is there any um, convention by which we need to, uh, if we are signed in as a Portland, Oregon account, that that needs to be connected to um, to our account that is our commissioner account for public record? That's a great question. I don't know if that falls in my remit to answer, but I would offer this suggestion. Um, when you create a portlandoregon.gov account, you can create that account using any email address that you choose to use to create that account. So if you have a portlandoregon.gov email account as a commissioner, you can create a new portlandoregon.gov account using that email address, if you so choose. And by using that portlandoregon.gov email account, we could link any uh, lists or notes that you might take um, acting in your capacity as a commissioner back to your email account. Now, whether or not that is the operating procedure that, that this commission chooses to take, uh, that's that's beyond me. But from a technical standpoint, that's how that would work. Great. Thank you. Uh, may I, I just, just jump in? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sandra, you go first. Thanks. I'll, I'll jump oh, in. Sorry. If sorry. No, go for I'll it. I'll just add some historical perspective. When um, Derek was developing this map app, um, 
I don't know how many years ago. Um, he's pretty brilliant and he had all sorts of tools that the commissioners could use um, like he was just describing, like putting in their e your email address and creating an account and then reading and so that you could see which ones you had read, you could star, you could put notes. Um, we and the city attorneys got a little bit concerned about that being part of the public record. And um, so, so we haven't encouraged commissioners to be using some of those tools. I think it's definitely something that we could do in this next generation and, and think about how the commissioners could use the tools so that it best serves your needs. Um, but I just want to remind everyone of the, the city attorney training that anything you put in writing, of course, is public record. Um, I also, um, I, I would hate to see that some it be visible that some testimony had been read and maybe not other pieces of testimony. So some things to take into consideration. Yeah, that's a great point, Sandra, and something I failed to mention, but should be known, yes. Um, if you are signed in, and frankly, even if you're an unknown user, this system does keep track of what you read and what you don't read. So right now I'm signed out. If I read a piece of testimony, uh, you can see here that it's logging that I read this, right? And if I go to the next one, I've read now two. Um, now, I'm an unknown user, so that's not getting written to a database in any way, shape, or form. Um, that is getting stored in your browser session. So if I were to open this in a, a window that doesn't save that, it's going to say uh, that I haven't read well, <laughs> live demos, right? It still says I read two. <laughs> um, as I refresh that, now it says, hey, you know, you haven't read anything. Um, if I was signed in, then that does get saved to a database that a user with that account has read this piece of testimony and has not read this other piece of testimony. So that would be a legitimate thing to consider as you make a decision as to whether or not to use a, a known user account to read this testimony. I might just jump in really quickly just to say, uh, again, Patricia Defender for, for the record, I think everything that Sandra said is correct. So just, I would just encourage you to keep that in mind. And um, I think that those who've used the system maybe can share their experience, but generally speaking, it, it's it's pretty easy to, to read kind of as a not assigned in user and, um, yeah, I think it, it sort of, you know, it, it's a it's a useful tool just using it in that way is what I would say. And it is definitely the, the way in which you will keep in touch with what testimony is being provided in writing. So, you know, we do encourage you to read it, of course, um, and we just want to make sure that some of these other tools that, that can tie back, you know, you just have to remember that it is would ultimately be part of the public record. Sorry, briefly, Derek, you made this? You created it? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, my students love it. Thank you so much. It's awesome. No, you're welcome. Uh, it was a team effort as well. I will pass along your praise. Thank you. <laughs> OK, are there any other questions for Eric? I mean, Derek, excuse me. So sorry. Pardon me. Okay. So maybe we'll, uh, Sandra, uh, we'll go on to the next um, piece of the training, which I guess is, is that Barry? Yes, it is. It's um, my colleague, Barry Manning. We wanted to give an overview of Oregon's land use system and the comprehensive plan. And Barry is our interim comprehensive plan um, manager right now. And he's been, I don't know, Barry, we've been colleagues for a couple decades now with the Bureau for a long time. There you go. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm Barry you. Manning with the Bureau of Planning Sustainability. As Sandra said, I'm the interim uh, 
manager of the uh, comprehensive plan team. And I'm here tonight to give you a fairly high level overview of comprehensive planning in uh, Portland and how it relates to um, the state of Oregon and Metro planning efforts. And so um, this is not going to be complete by any stretch. There's plenty to learn. And uh, I brought the reference document if we need to, if questions come up, but uh, uh, this is at a high level grounding you in some of the fundamentals of our planning framework. So tonight, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Oregon planning program and its relationship to uh, to Portland planning. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about metro regional planning relationship and then just cover some uh, high level um, overview and highlights of the Portland 2035 comprehensive plan. Uh, just to start off with the, the, this diagram or this the slide shows the relationships of many of these plans. I'm going to move this out of the way so I can see what I'm doing here. Um, as the slide says, Oregon state law requires cities to maintain comprehensive plans. So that's part of the state's planning program. And when we develop plans locally, they must be consistent with Oregon statewide land use laws. Um, periodically, they must be updated. That's part of the whole process in Oregon is to update your plans periodically so they don't get too old. And um, plans are also coordinated with Metro here in the Metro region, uh, which has um, some land use planning uh, guidance and authority in the Portland Metro region. Um, so what about comprehensive plans in Oregon? Um, this slide really just shows you or spells out what Oregon law defines as a comprehensive plan. It's a generalized coordinated land use map and a policy statement of the governing body, the local government that interrelates all functions and natural systems and activities relating to the use of lands. And then it goes on to list that it's including but not limited to sewer and water systems, transportation systems, educational facilities, recreation, natural resources, and other things. So they're very, it's a very comprehensive uh, uh, look at development opportunities in, um, in cities. Um, the Oregon statewide land use program is uh, based in statewide land use goals. Um, the Oregon program was um, created in the early 1970s, um, and uh, it was really uh, designed to um, to uh, uh, manage growth in urban areas and then also protect farm and forest land and other resources in the state. So that was the basis of the program. It established a set of 19 uh, goals and uh, uh, I'll show you those in just a moment. Most of those goals are accompanied by guidelines, which provide more guidance on how cities can comply with those uh, and counties can comply with those goals and, uh, and uh, through comprehensive planning. So the goals I'm showing you here, there's 19 of them. Um, I believe there weren't 19 originally to start off with. That's grown. Um, most of these apply in the city of Portland, and we make uh, findings against them when we do planning efforts to make sure that we're consistent with the statewide goals, and the state also informs us uh, of changes. Um, some of these do not apply in Portland. So, for instance, goals three and four with respect to agricultural and forest lands don't apply in Portland. Um, 16, 17, and 18 relate to uh, coastal areas and don't apply in Portland as well, um, as well as 19. But otherwise, the city needs to be in conformance with the statewide plan, uh, statewide planning goals when it de develops a plan or amendments to plans. I also want to share with you a few key terms that you might become familiar with uh, as you are reviewing plans and, and getting familiar with things. Um, these are four of the key ones. Uh, DLCD stands for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. That's a state agency that administers the statewide program and ensures, as it says here, lo local jurisdictions comply with the, with the program, provides technical assistance. LCDC is the Land Conservation and Development Commission, provides policy direction for land use planning program and oversees DLCD. LUBA is one you might hear frequently, uh, Land Use Board of Appeals. That's a special um, statewide court that hears uh, challenges to land use uh, plans and decisions. Um, as this says, other states, uh, this is done in regular circuit courts, but here in Oregon, it's 
this Luba is the body that makes uh, decisions uh, on appeals and things of that nature. And then PAPA, you might hear occasionally, which is a post-acknowledgement plan amendment. Plans in Oregon uh, get acknowledged by the state when they're, when they're found to be in compliance with state standards. And a post-acknowledgement plan amendment um, is the, uh, the type of um, uh, plan you'll often be seeing where we bring in an area or a neighborhood plan or a, a specific plan, and that's an uh, amendment to our existing acknowledged comprehensive plan. So it's a post-acknowledgement plan amendment. I'm going to switch over and talk a little bit about Metro, which is our regional government. For those of you, I'm sure you're all probably familiar. Um, uh, it's also not only the regional government, but it's uh, Portland's Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, among the many functions uh, Metro plays, it also plays a key role in shaping the region's development through regional land use and transportation planning. Um, some of the things Metro does is it sets and periodically adjusts the urban growth boundary, which uh, identifies land in the Portland region that is available for urban development and distinguishes it from rural areas outside of the urban growth boundary. Um, this diagram here is part of the 2040 growth concept, and in the mid-1990s, Metro adopted the 2040 growth concept, which established the basic framework uh, for regional growth through development in centers, main streets, corridors, light rail stations, and other typologies. And those are shown on this map. You can see uh, these dots represent the different centers that Metro identified in the 2040 growth plan. And the lines on the map, for instance, here, you can see those are main streets and corridors. You can see light rail stations that are identified. Um, for instance, the green line light rail stations that I'm identifying here. And that hierarchy of centers includes um, areas both within and outside of Portland. In, in Portland, it identifies downtown Portland as the main center of the region. And uh, it is the central uh, and largest center in the 2040 plan. Um, moving through the hierarchy, it also identifies several regional centers, which are the next largest place in this hierarchy for accommodating growth and development and, and thought to be bigger places. Um, in Portland, Gateway, which is uh, located uh, at the confluence of I-205 and I-84, is identified as a regional center. But um, comparatively, other places such as downtown Beaverton and uh, uh, I believe downtown Oregon City, for example, are also designated as regional centers. So those are the scales of places that uh, uh, are designated as regional centers. Gateway was designated in an aspirational fashion, so it's got a ways to go to get there, but uh, it is our uh, second largest center in, in the city. Um, the 2040 concept also identified a series of town centers, again, areas where growth and development would be focused to manage growth effectively. Those include places like um, the Hollywood Town Center, which is I'm showing here on Sandy Boulevard or St. John's, Lentz uh, at uh, 92nd Avenue uh, and Foster Road, and on the west side, uh, Hillsdale and uh, West Portland Town Center, which was recently, a uh, plan was recently adopted for, uh, and uh, Derek mentioned in his previous conversation. So the plan, the Metro Regional Plan sets up this hierarchy for focusing growth and development and managing growth in the region and, and managing our um, uh, maintaining farm and forest land and, and managing our growth effectively within inside the region. Um, Metro also established a regional framework plan and a functional plan to provide the region with a coordinated growth management plan and regional urban form. Cities in the region must be consistent with that plan, and uh, it, but it doesn't dictate how cities can do the, their plans, uh, and we, we do that here. But we need to be consistent with the Metro functional plan, a regional plan, which uh, guides us in terms of um, densities and town centers and neighborhoods and things of that nature and where um, industrial land uh, needs to be conserved. Um, another function from Metro is it is as the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Portland. It's authorized to coordinate and plan investments in the transportation system uh, for the tri-county area, Multnomah, Clackamas, and Washington counties. Um, so the regional transportation plan is coordinated through Metro and guides and coordinates investments in that regional system and it's informed by the city's local transportation system plan. So there's a lot of transportation and land use planning coordination at the metro level. So I'm going to jump into Portland's comprehensive plan and again talk at a very high level about um, 
how the plan is structured and uh, and uh, and and what's in it and some of the some of the concepts that translate from the metro plan all the way down to the city's plan. So the 2035 comprehensive plan sets the framework for development of the city over the next 20 years. It was um, became effective in 2018, and it has um, several different elements. It has a comprehensive plan elements, which include a vision and guiding principles. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. It has um, m uh, multiple goals and policies. I'll talk about those in a little bit uh, as well. It includes a comprehensive plan map, a list of significant projects. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And it also includes transportation policies, street classifications, the street plan, part of our transportation system plan. It's based on and includes supporting documents that include inventory and an analysis, such as the buildable lands inventory, which indi which uh, uh, describes where uh, development uh, can occur in, in Portland based on um, the amount of development that is uh, uh, at hand right now, uh, whether there's opportunity for additional redevelopment uh, because land is underutilized, things of that nature or vacant or constrained. Uh, it also includes an employment opportunities analysis, which really sets the framework for how we allocate different kinds of land in Portland. And we're underway with an update of that right now. Uh, housing needs analysis, which we're also underway for with an update for right now, which is uh, informing uh, how we should plan for future housing growth in the city of Portland and a natural resources inventory. I also note that it includes school facilities plans uh, as they are adopted. There's one adopted one right now for uh, David Douglas and public facilities plans such as that transportation system plan I mentioned, as well as other facilities plans. On the other side of this diagram, um, the comp plan is implemented through several different tools, um, the zoning code, the zoning map, um, service coordination agreements, urban renewal plans that are administered by Prosper Portland, um, also annexations and development agreements. And I think Patricia is going to speak to some of those a little bit later in the next presentation. So Portland 2035, just kind of going through some of the elements in the in the comprehensive plan. It does have a vision statement. Prosper Portland is a prosperous, healthy, equitable, and resilient city where everyone has access to opportunity and is engaged in shaping decisions that affect their lives. That's the vision statement that leads the comprehensive plan and is followed by a set of guiding principles that are uh, used to um, help guide and balance uh, policies as we move through the plan. So there's five of them. Three of them are listed here right now. Um, economic prosperity, human health, and environmental health on this um, slide. I won't read these, but the guiding principles are intended to uh, recognize that the plan must be balanced, integrated, and multidisciplinary. And uh, the influence of guiding principles is seen throughout the plan and they can be used to inform decision making when competing or conflicting policies uh, are being considered. So oftentimes in decision making, we'll have policies that conflict with each other and these guiding principles are intended to help inform some of that decision making and evaluate trade-offs. The other two that are equity, which is a major focus of uh, the 2035 comp plan, um, and resilience, which uh, is also a focus of the 2035 comp plan. I wanted to share a few more elements that are background materials and then um, some of the growth management kind of framework functions of the comp plan. Uh, this diagram here is depicting um, complete neighborhoods. And this was an element of the background work that went into the comprehensive plan. And it's a concept underlying some of the comp plan elements. And the idea behind this is uh, the comp plan should create more complete neighborhoods throughout the city over time. This will allow people to have access to goods and services and other community amenities in their neighborhoods more easily and without the need to rely on autos for all of their travel. Uh, a fundamental concept in the comp plan is if we build compact urban places, people can rely less on automobiles and personal uh, travel and can walk, bike, or take transit to more uh, meet more of their daily needs. Um, the 20 minute neighborhood index shown on this map measures access to community amenities and services and the areas shown in yellow 
have a higher access to services, while the areas shown in purple have the lowest access. So a major concept and theme in the plan is to make planning decisions about land use and investments, including infrastructure investments that relate to the comp plan, that can improve access to a broader array of Portlanders. So um, we may want to focus more of our efforts in areas that are purple or uh, in the darker red areas rather than yellow areas to improve those accesses and services. This is implemented in various ways, uh, partially through the centers and corridors concept shown on some of the slides that I'm coming up to now. Oop. Before I get to those, I want to review the uh, comp plan goals and policies. These are the 10 chapters of the comp plan, and uh, they touch on a number of different policy areas. Um, one that is an overview of the plan itself, one that talks about community involvement, urban form, which we'll talk about a little bit more in terms of the centers and corridors, uh, design and development, housing, economic development, environmental watershed health, public facilities and services, transportation, and then land use designations and zoning, which relate to the comprehensive plan map. I think in subsequent meetings, you'll be getting more in-depth uh, discussions of each of these policy or uh, chapters and policy areas. So I'm not going to go into detail on them right now, but these uh, chapters contain the goals and the policies that really guide decision-making in Portland. I want to highlight a couple of them that I think are important and fundamental to the plan. One is the community involvement chapter. I've listed the community involvement goals here. Um, the 2035 comp plan emphasizes deep and inclusive community involvement to um, in planning and investment decisions. In addition to many established organizations, the plan calls for broadening the base of community involvement to increase participation in among underserved and underrepresented communities. So that's a, a major emphasis in the community involvement uh, chapter. I also wanted to mention that in addition to broad community involvement and the role that commissions such as the Planning Commission and other commissions such as the Design Commission play in um, public involvement by through the testimony and, and other um, means, um, the comp plan policies also supported the establishment of a community involvement committee to promote feedback on processes for individual planning efforts. So we also have that committee as well uh, sponsored by BPS. Another fundamental element of the comprehensive plan uh, is the urban design framework and I'm showing you that diagram here. It um, along with the goals and policies of the plan the urban design framework provides kind of the long-range planning framework for development and redevelopment within the city. The diagram includes information about centers and corridors, and you can see those outlined here clearly with the large uh, red centers, including downtown Portland, I, the regional center gateway, which I mentioned, uh, town centers such as Hollywood and St. John's, and a number of smaller centers that are also identified here, uh, which we call neighborhood centers and is an augmentation of the Metro 2040 centers concept. Uh, this diagram also includes information about um, city greenways and green spaces, uh, habitat corridors, and one thing that's identified here is that the, the urban design framework also embodies the pattern areas that were adopted as part of the uh, 2035 comprehensive plan, which suggests that different portions of Portland have different characters and that um, investments, codes, um, should reflect the, the the differences among these different areas. For instance, um, inner Portland uh, in the traditional pre-war uh, neighborhoods are designated as inner neighborhoods and have certain characteristics that are common amongst those. Um, eastern neighborhoods east of I-205 were annexed later in Portland's development and have different characteristics with a more uh, treed character in many areas uh, than, than uh, inner neighborhoods um, and also areas of uh, challenges with 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 um, with environmental uh, conditions such as tree canopy. Western neighborhoods have a different topography uh, uh, that make that area unique. And then this also identifies um, um, rivers and the central city as two other pattern areas that have distinct characteristics. 
Um, I mean, I've mentioned the Metro 2040 growth, so growth concept, excuse me, uh, and its centers and corridors. And I've mentioned the urban design framework uh, with its centers and corridors identified. And the centers and corridors growth strategy is a key component of Portland's comprehensive plan. Um, Portland's expected to grow by approximately 260,000 new residents and 140,000 new jobs over the next 20 years. The Centers and Corridors growth strategy furthers the Metro 2040 framework plan in Portland and helps focus where growth can occur. The concept includes the Central City and Gateway Regional Centers, as we've talked about, as well as the town centers and neighborhood centers in Portland. So those are identified in these, again, larger and smaller dots, the smaller dots being the neighborhood center that are distributed throughout the city. These smaller centers serve as smaller hubs for community access to goods and services at a local level. Um, the centers are connected by civic and neighborhood corridors, the civic corridors being the larger, uh, thicker green lines, which are often the city's larger uh, and busier traffic arterials, which are also major transportation spines, and smaller neighborhood corridors, which uh, connect to the neighborhood centers and are uh, typically smaller scale corridors and streets, but are often well served with transit as well. Here's an illustration that shows what the concept looks like in terms of the scale of development in these centers, starting at the left, the smallest scale neighborhood centers. Uh, they're expected to see development, concentrating housing and jobs in the area and uh, services for community uh, with scale up to four stories or so. Um, down at the bottom left of the slide, you'll see the um, diagram for the town centers, which are expected to serve more um, households in the area. They have a larger catchment area, so to speak, um, serving about 7,000 households um, and with development of five to seven stories in, in scale. Um, the regional center gateway, uh, again, thought to serve a larger uh, area of up to 15,000 uh, households uh, with building scales that's, that, are, that are larger of up to five to 12 stories. And then finally, on the bottom right, depicting the central city, you know, with many more uh, housing units being served, it's the center of the region and the center of Portland uh, with very much larger building scales of 30 uh, or greater stories. Amongst those centers, the central city is expected to accommodate about 30% of the planned growth over the next 20 years. And the centers and corridors in neighborhoods, uh, excluding the central city, are expected to accommodate about 50% of the expected growth in, uh, in the city. Um, the other 20% is assumed to be absorbed in neighborhood areas uh, outside of the centers and corridors. Um, moving on, I wanted to show you the comprehensive plan map. This is one of the key elements of the comprehensive plan. It's the long range land use plan for the city and is one of the, the main implementation components. Uh, it identifies land use designations for all parts of the city and helps to implement land use and growth concepts in the plan. So the colors on this map represent different land uses that are allowed throughout the city yellow being uh, largely lower density residential areas with the red and orange lines depicting um, commercial and uh, other types of centers along uh, corridors and, and in centers such as uh, Central City, uh, Hollywood and, and others. The darker blue colors uh, represent multi-dwelling uh, designations and this map uh, helps guide and direct land use and development over the city for the next 20 years. You can see it also um, identifies and uh, it's a little bit hard to see here, but outlined around, for instance, Hollywood or the light rail station at 60th Avenue, it, it outlines the, the geographies of the centers that uh, are identified in the comp plan. And the comprehensive plan map is very directly tied to zoning. The comp plan map uh, and the zoning are closely linked. Uh, the comprehensive plan map indicates the intended future land use uh, of the comprehensive plan. Um, it's the long-term growth and aspiration. Um, some of the comp plan designations, for instance, in our uh, mixed use areas allow for multiple zoning 
options. So there's some room for change. Others have a war of a one-to-one relationship. Um, but the relationship is that the comp plan indicates the future intended land use and the zoning map and code govern the uses and development that are allowed currently. Those two maps are generally in alignment with each other. They're usually the same, except where obstacles to development occur. So for instance, if there are infrastructure or other kinds of capacity constraints that would not allow future, allow realization of the comprehensive plan map, uh, currently, you know, uh, instead of allowing, uh, larger scale and more intensive development, the zoning might allow less intense or smaller scale development in this interim period. Just a couple more slides and then I'll hand it back. Um, another element of the comprehensive plan related to that is the citywide systems plan. It's a 20 year coordinated infrastructure plan for areas within the city's urban services boundary. Um, it's an inventory of uh, infrastructure assets and physical systems that are necessary to maintain the city. It includes transportation, water services, sewer, sewer and stormwater, excuse me, um, parks and recreation plans, and uh, a list for improvements, as well as um, other city facilities such as city hall, uh, office buildings, and uh, fire and police stations. Um, that plan is a very comprehensive uh, plan that's related to the comp plan. But as part of the comp plan, there is a smaller subset of projects that are identified and, and in the comp plan, and it's called out as a list of significant projects. And that list of significant projects is intended as a long-term plan for meeting the infrastructure and residential and employment growth allowed in plan for uh, in the comp plan. Uh, the list of significant projects includes a subset of the projects that are included in the citywide systems plan. Um, so uh, here's an example of what one of the um, lists of projects that might you might encounter in the city, citywide systems plan or in the um, list of significant projects. It talks about the lead agency that may implement the uh, project, who owns the facility, what the project's name is, a description of the project, and an estimated cost. So this is the implementation of the infrastructure elements of the comp plan, which are very related to the land use pieces of it. So that was a fairly high level overview of comp plan and its relationships with uh, Oregon and regional planning. Be happy to answer any questions I can for you uh, at this time. I have a question. How do projects that originate from within the community, uh, how are they considered on the significant project list? We have processes that identify those types of, of plans as part of a, the, the uh, system updates. Um, and I can only exp speak from my experience working through that in the transportation system plan, for instance, if, if there's a, a need out there in the community as part of that planning process, that kind of a project can be brought up by the community and elevated into one of those plans. So um, we're not due for a, a TSP update for a few years here, but oftentimes when we're out in the community doing joint projects, land use and transportation projects, those kinds of um, issues will come up and they'll get embedded in um, area and neighborhood planning projects that we uh, ultimately bring to the commission and city council for adoption. Okay. So that that's like more of a living part of the overall comp plan. Like the comp plan is this process that's undertaken every, well, what did you say, 20 years? Yeah, initially um, 20 years. Initially the, every yeah. 20 years and it's long range planning. But then for the there's the TSP and the significant projects lists, and how are those updated? Are they a more living component, and with what frequency are they updated? Maybe, I'm sorry, maybe I could just jump in really quickly, Patricia Diefendorfer. Um, so I wanted to just give the example of the West Portland Town Center plan. That's a plan that the Planning and Sustainability Commission saw more recently. Um, it, I think it's a good example of a plan that is a geographically specific plan, right, for a town center, the West Portland Town Center. It, if you recall, it amended the comp plan. Uh, so in some ways, the comp plan is, you know, a living document because when we do these area plans, for example, we might amend key policies of the comp plan uh, based on the, the outreach that was done and the goals that are trying to be achieved for that local area the, and the way in which the comp, the, the comp plan policies are being tailored for the area. 
Um, so you you may also recall that the the West Portland Town Center plan did have some TSP or transportation system plan amendments, um, and so those things are as in, it's a reflection of the fact that transportation and land use planning are usually done very closely together uh, when you're updating a plan for an area or developing a plan for an area. Um, communities, that's part of the, the conversation with community is like what infrastructure needs are there, what will support, you know, uh, the growth and development of this area. And so in that plan, there was um, identified needs for transportation, uh, you know, upgrades and for, um, I believe it was stormwater, correct? So those are ways in which the comp plan is updated as as individual plans and uh, area plans are conducted. If there's a community plan that doesn't have um, a, a home in the bureau um, in a major way, like Albina Vision, for example, is there is that in the comp plan or is there a way for that to become part of the comp plan? Yeah, so that's a that's an, a good example of something that's um, kind of a community led process that's happening right now. Um, it is very much anticipated that 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 concept that's being developed in conjunction with community will necessitate some probably zoning code changes, some comp plan changes to bring them into greater alignment with each other. And so when that process evolves and gets closer to a time when there's you know more of a, a complete kind of consensus and vision around it, and then it will probably parlay and become a project that will be uh, come before the planning commission for those kinds of changes. So, so yes, that that is one way in which it can come come about as well. Thank you. Sure. If I could, I um, sort of a, a, a follow up to, to just that concept. Um, Understanding everything that you just said, if we look at sort of the scope and the intentionality of, of Portland 2035, th there will be, how, how does it govern the actions of entities that are outside of the city? If you look at transportation planning, infrastructure development, even if you're looking at Albina or, or any other area that has emerged over a, a, a two decade period. Now there are sort of planning and um, infrastructure development efforts that are being imported from places outside of the city. H how do you reconcile that? I mean, who sits first chair when that activity now has an opportunity to materialize? Do you want to take that one, Patricia? Sure. Yeah, Patricia Diefendorfer again for the for the record. That's that's a really good question. I think it speaks to the very iterative nature of planning, quite honestly. So, for example, we have this comp plan twenty thirty five uh, plan that you heard a lot about from Barry. It's a framework, right? It anticipated at the time that the outreach was being done on that plan over the course of I believe very many years, but it was ultimately updated in twenty eighteen. It was a, um, an expression of the vision for the city in that time with, you know, uh, with the outreach that was done at that time. Um, those kinds of plans are very generational. They stick around for a long time, and they usually are pretty relevant for a long time. Um, but there are, there are things that occur, right? Um, opportunities come up. Funding comes up. Um, opportunities for major infrastructure improvements. And so the plan becomes a place to uh, capture capture that i think that you know the the abt the albina vision trust is a really good example or rose quarter right so a big transportation project is already it's already in the tsp for the the comp plan it's already in the transportation system plan because the, of this iterative process between metro and the the cities in the metro region to inform the the metro the regional transportation plan there's a very iterative process around that so some of the ideas get generated from the city and make their way into the metro plan and vice versa some ideas get generated they're coming they're much more bigger regional projects right or statewide level projects like a rose quarter like a interstate bridge project and so the the metro regional transportation planning process 
is an opportunity to feed those into city plans as well, right? So it's an iterative process. Similarly with something like AVT, you know, we've been doing some investigation of the, of the uh, comp plan and the central city plan just to see how aligned some of the ideas within the Albina Vision Trust uh, you know, concept plan, for example, are. And I th we found that there's quite a bit of alignment. There's, you know, the, the central city plan and the comp plan really are kind of like a container for a lot of different things to happen. And there, you know, our initial assessment is that there is a lot of um, alignment between what is being proposed through the Albina Vision Trust project and the, and the comp plan and the central city plan. But that doesn't also mean that there may not be small tweaks needed, right, in order to bring them um, into conformance with each other as that vision is being developed. And so that is, I think, a very, you know, that is kind of um, an expression how, of how the comp plan really is a living document and um, the planning process is a very iterative process. I hope that's helpful. Other questions? Mary Rain, we see you. <laughs> Yeah, hi, thank you so much, Barry, for that great overview. Um, my question was specific to the housing, the slide that had the housing production units. Um, were those units uh, part of the 2035 plan projections in terms of what each um, center could accommodate and not actually a reflection of um, current units, I guess that's part one. And then part two of my question is, is the purpose of the housing needs analysis to really look at what those projections were as per the 2035 comp plan and um, give us a progress chart in terms of how is each um, center essentially accomplishing development per, per those projections? Why don't I take I can, the first part okay. of it and you take the second part sure. of it? Yeah, those okay. diagrams are really more um, uh, estimates of the, the kind of population centers that each of those um, types of centers could accommodate. So neighborhood centers being the smallest were, I believe were in the 3,000 household range, um, town centers uh, in the 7,000 household range. So those are kind of idealized numbers around those areas. They're not necessarily growth targets or uh, current conditions, but they were estimated to be the kind of market areas essentially in terms of the number of housing units it could support a center of that size so that was and i think when you get a deeper dive on uh, on the urban form chapter you'll hear more about that from one of our my colleagues yeah um so again patricia defend for the record i i think that's exactly right i would i would just add that um those are meant to communicate to to community um, or you know any any interested parties, what we mean by those centers, the scale. So it's it's not like an exact uh, number. Or it's not a, you know uh, the population of that area. It's just trying to relative in comparison to each other. These four kind of the hierarchy of centers. It's supposed to give a sense of how much population you might expect in that area, what kind of level of jobs, what kind of um, other kind of institutional uses you might expect, and just the scale, the scale of the development. So, you know, how uh, Barry mentioned in neighborhood centers, which are the, the lower scale centers, you might have buildings of four stories as compared to downtown where you're having buildings of 30 plus stories. So it's just to help, a way to help people understand that the nature of places and what kind of scale and, and range of uses we're talking about uh, when we talk about these different centers. Um, uh, as far as the question of the, the housing needs uh, analysis, I think it's correct that the reason um, the state requires that the housing needs analysis be conducted and also the economic opportunities analysis be conducted at intervals, which I believe is about six years or so is the uh, the timeline for these updates is to make sure that your comprehensive plan continues to be tracking what the needs are in terms of the, or what the forecasts are for jobs and housing, and that you continue to show that you have um, the land base to accommodate that and the, z the zoning. So the, that's what the BLI you saw in that, that diagram of the different components. 
of the comprehensive plan, there's a buildable lands inventory, and it's that inventory that allows us to be able to to gauge, you know, what what sites are available for development of housing, what sites are available for uh, develop, um, economic development and, and accommodating jobs of different kinds, whether it be office or industrial, and ensuring that we continue to have over the life of a plan the the land needed to accommodate those those projections, if that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I had a, um, I, maybe I just missed it in the slide, but I was just wondering if there was, if in the comprehensive plan, if there was anything that dealt with um, making sure that, I guess, uh, housing affordability was kind of locked in there um, or that there would be like community housing built in these particular areas. I, I, I didn't see that in the plan at all, yeah. but maybe I just maybe, missed it. Maybe I could just start us out and then, um, Barry, if you have anything to add. So I wanted to just... Um, as Barry mentioned, uh, over the course of these meetings, we're going to be providing kind of additional deep dives on different topics. Housing is definitely going to be one of those topics, um, as, as well as economic development, because this commission is going to see later in the fall uh, the very documents we're talking about, the updates to the housing needs analysis and the economic opportunities analysis are among the bigger policy documents that this commission is going to see in the fall. So in preparation for that, we're going to give you a much deeper dive on the housing chapter of the comp plan, on the economic development chapter of the comp plan, and you will see that there are going to be a, a, a number of policies dealing with um, the you know affordability of housing, the need for affordable housing, um, and that is it, that is um, implemented in the city in a number of different ways, but the inclusionary housing uh, requirement is one of the ways in which the the city, you know, that that uh, I guess policy objective is implemented in the city. And as you may have saw from the presentation uh, that Sandra did about the different links, um, the commissioners. Um, members of this commission who sit on other boards and commissions, and uh, Vice Chair Thompson is one of the people who's sitting right now on the um, uh, stu a study to, it's called the Inclusionary Housing Recalibration Study. So there is a effort underway right now to um, just kind of look at the inclusionary housing requirement and see if it needs, many times these kinds of regulations need periodic revisiting to see how they're working, whether the regulations need to be fine-tuned, and I imagine we'll have a lot more to uh, update this commission on with respect to that work. But to answer the question in a nutshell, yes, I mean, affordability is definitely a component of the policies that you'll find in the housing uh, section of the comprehensive plan. I have one more quick thing just to back up a little bit to Mike's question from a bit ago. When we were um, in the process of uh, making the planning commission and adopting new powers and duties, we talked a lot about um, specific projects and the significant project list and whether or not that's something that is like part of our work or our purview and part of the discussion was that when those significant transportation projects in particular are put in the comp plan they're they're so general that like our ability to see whether or not there's alignment with the comp plan goals is not possible like at that point and so that we specifically included um, in our powers and duties, the ability to advise on significant transportation policy projects and issues. Now, when those are from outside of the city and how all of that works, you know, they, that becomes really complicated and to your question about who, who sits first chair. But I think that I, I just wanted to point out that, that we, in discussing that, felt like it was within our purview for um, specific projects to come before the commission and you know it, it gets a little bit fuzzy maybe how <laughs> there's there's follow-up there but it is something that we feel is important to um, at least have access to I, I don't know if that relates to what you were getting at at all but yeah oh, 
sorry, any more questions from the commissioners on this portion of the training? Thank you very much, and uh, right. look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thanks, Barry, so much. All right. Um, do we? Do anyone? Do we want to take a, a small break? Or I was just thinking that maybe a break is in order. Um, I, I will. Let's definitely take a break. I have just a, a few slides for my section, and then we have um, Sandra has her the zoning code. Um, training and and then we have the the last uh, briefing item but we'll go ahead and take a break now and come back should we do 10 minutes does that sound or is that five five minutes okay great okay we'll we'll come back together at five minutes thank you
get started. We can go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and reconvene. Thank you. Chair Romero, if you don't mind, I think we're going to rearrange things just a little bit because of the time, as you may have heard us discussing. So, Sandra, I'm happy to, to turn it back to you for the zoning code training. Okay, great. Let's do that. Um, hello, Commissioners. Sandra Wood, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability again. Um, we're continuing our training today. I'm glad you had a little break. I will start with um, our zoning code training. And um, the reason I'm jumping ahead from Patricia is because I really want you to hear some of the framework of the zoning code before you hear from my colleague, JP McNeil, who will present the planning commission. I mean, the parking compliance project. So if you'll bear with me for one second. Okay, thank you very much and thanks for having me. Um, you know who I am. I've spoken up a few times today's meeting. Uh, one of the team, one of the hats I wear in the bureau is to manage the um, the code development team at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And our team works on projects like the parking compliance project that you'll see right after this presentation. And we also, if we're not working on our own projects, we're writing and editing code for other project teams at BPS and sometimes even um, other bureaus um, because we have quite a bit of experience um, on how to translate some of the policies that you just heard um, Barry talk about into implementation tools. And one of the things we really consider is the longevity of tools. So we want the code to work for today, tomorrow, and how will it be implemented 15 years from now? So we think about that. Um, before we jump into the code itself, I wanted to spend a moment to focus on how we move from discussion on what matters to us. And that's a little bit what, what Barry was talking to you about the comprehensive plan. It's like, what matters to us? What are the values we hold as a community? Um, and those values are listed in the comprehensive plan and how those values get translated to the regulations that um, end up in the zoning code. Um, so this slide shows a little bit of that, a little glimpse of that. So the goals of the comprehensive plan are the basis for all the regulations in the zoning code. And many of those regulations are clearly tied to community values. So for example, we have the value of human health and having active transportation. And some of the rules that you'll find in the zoning codes require that buildings are built to the sidewalk, that parking has to be on the side or behind a building, and that the building main entrance needs to be at the sidewalk and that bike parking is provided. All of this creates a more pedestrian friendly environment, which is another one of the values in the zoning code or policies. Um, and that's how we translate it into the rules and give our community instructions to the development community about how we want the city to look and operate. Um, the value of economic prosperity, for example, is another example where we have a rule that we limit non-residential, non-industrial uses in our industrial zones. We want to protect the industrial zones for industrial uses and for job that job base. Um, so that is translated in that way. And we care about environmental health. So we inventory where our environmental resources are and what we want to conserve. And we imply um, environmental zoning and have rules about what can happen in those zones and whether mechanical equipment can go in or whether it's some handheld equipment. So those are just some examples of where our rules um, are implementing and carrying out our values. 
Um, and I mentioned that because I think a lot of times people think the zoning code is just, I, I don't know what they think. I love the zoning code, but a lot of times people think it's just a bunch of rules that us bureaucrats um, come up with. But really what we're trying to do is obviously create um, a prosperous, healthy, economically you know, prosperous city, um, et cetera, like Barry was mentioning. Um, our zoning code in Portland was written in 1990, and it was originally adopted then, and we recognized then that it would need to be constantly updated as the world around us changes. Like in 1990, they never really expected all of us to be walking around with cell phones in our pockets, so there was no need to regulate um, cell towers that needed to be built in the city, and that was a new chapter that was added to the zoning code. Um, I don't think they expected that there would be so many people who want to vacation and stay in complete strangers' houses, and the Airbnb would make it really easy for people to do that. Well, that came along, and we didn't have any rules for it, so we had to think about that and understand what the impacts were and write rules about that. And of course, unfortunately, we didn't also expect that Portland would become so expensive and that there would be a greater need for requiring affordable housing. Um, so getting to Commissioner um, Pounsel's question earlier about how it how how do these things come to be, um, the policies are set in the comprehensive plan and we can, there's many uh, policies around affordable housing and the location of those affordable housing. But then we had a zoning code project called inclusionary housing project and we had to decide what we wanted to regulate what the rules would be, and then how to incorporate it into the zoning code so that a developers would find it and then it would work within the structure of the code. So our planning projects that you'll see are often instigated by changes in the world um, and changes in perceptions because communities change um, as the world um, moves forward. Um, in addition to thinking about the rules of, and what the regulations are, you also will be thinking about where those regulations apply. Mapping the city is a really a policy decision also. And sometimes we have projects that just do mapping changes. One of the ones that you'll see later in the fall um, is called Southeast Rising. And as of right now, there are no code changes for that and just mapping changes. Um, but this is a zoning map of the city, very, very, very similar to the comprehensive plan map. There's probably about a 10% difference between the two. You can see that the arterials are line, arterial streets are lined with commercial nodes in the red um, and multi-dwelling, which is the blue, um, with backed by lower density and single dwelling, which is all the yellow in between them. Um, so there's commercial centers, there's industrial sanctuaries, all the green is open space zones, usually for parks. So I mentioned that because I think we th think about regulating a policy carried out by rules, but the map is also a rule and is obviously a um, foundational to understanding where the rules apply. Um, before I get into this, I just wanted to share a little bit of insights into how we do our work too. As staff, we write the code at kind of at the end of the community discussion. We write it after we agree on the values and have discussed the trade-offs and how we're balancing multiple comprehensive plan goals. As we work through those discussions, we ask ourselves a lot of questions that ultimately lead to decisions about the rules. So what are the impacts of a use? For example, we all love farmer's markets, um, but if one is set up next to an empty lot, um, next to an apartment building every Saturday morning and they begin at 6 a.m., would that be a problem or not? Um, where does it make sense to put uses that generate a lot of traffic is another type of question that we ask in the planning process. Um, so once we have all that fleshed out, we turn to a toolbox and figure out how to make those things happen. And oftentimes it is by amending the zoning code. Sometimes there are non-regulatory tools, um, but sometimes it's amending the zoning map also. So with that little introduction, I'll get into the, the weeds with the zoning code here. The city um, organizes its rules um, 
into what we call titles. And there are 34 city titles in the city rule system. Um, some, but not all, regulate development in the city. So for example, Title 11, trees, um, that regulates the, the preservation of trees and the planting of trees in development situations. Title 17, public improvements, regulates what like the sidewalk and the streets should look like um, during development. Titles 24, 25, 26, 27, those are all the building, plumbing, electrical, heating, and ventilation regulations that are Portland specific. There are those rules at the state level also that are um, more broadly used. So when people say the building code, they usually mean the state building code. Um, but then there are some special rules in Title 24. And then, of course, way down at Title 33 is the planning and zoning um, title. Um, in short, it's called, everyone just calls it uh, the zoning code, and that's Title 33. Um, before um, before a de applicant for a development proposal even looks at the zoning code, the first thing they're going to look at is what is their zoning, and they need to know their zoning in order to navigate the zoning code, and they'll want to look at three things. They'll want to know what their base zone is, what their overlay zones are, and if they have a plan district. Um, so... Um, this property, for example, that's highlighted, uh, that purple property with the white boundary, that property is in the CXD zone and in the Gateway Plan District. So the zoning map shows that it's CX, which is the base zone, which is a central um, commercial. And the D stand, so the little letters are an overlay zone. So in this case, a D is a design overlay zone and then the gateway plan district. So there's gonna be three chapters that that developer will need to look at to know what the rules are that apply to the property. And I'll show you an example of that as we go through. Um, so Title 33, Planning and Zoning, um, is, are the city's land use regulations and they contain regulations that relate to land uses and development. Um, development in the context of the zoning code means either new development, which is construction on a vacant site, or an alteration, which is altering something that is on a site that has existing development already. Portland's pretty built out, so we see a lot of alterations or um, sites that already have development and someone is putting an addition, for example, on their property. The zoning code applies to land and water, but has very limited applications in the right of way or streets. The basic structure of the code is on this side, and it's really organized to be a reference document. Chapters are grouped together based on related information. For example, all the regulations for the base zones can be found in the first group of chapters or what we call the 100s. And similarly, all the overlay zones are grouped together in the 400s and so on. Once you know the zoning of a particular piece of property, you can figure out from within related chapters um, which chapters apply. Um, at a minimum, every property in the city has a base zone. Within the base zone chapters, all the commercial zones are together in one chapter. All the employment and industrial zones are in another. The residential zones have two chapters, one for the single dwelling residential zones, the 33-110, and one for the multi-dwelling residential zones. Here's a list of all of the base zones in the city. The colors indicate the grouping of zones. For example, all the ones in the blue font are the single dwelling zones and all the ones in the green font are the multi-dwelling zones. Our newest base zones are the campus institution zones, those that are in the purple font on this slide. They came about after the comprehensive plan update where um, our employment analysis identified a shortage in land for college and hospital employment growth. So we switched some of those uses from being conditional uses to allowed uses and gave them their own zoning designation with their own rules. The base zones, um, 
Chapters tell us the uses that are allowed in each zone and describe the general development standards that apply in each zone. So uses, um, um, each chapter contains a table like this one that shows which uses are allowed or not allowed in the zone. This example happens to be from the commercial mixed use zones. The uses are grouped into categories such as residential, commercial, et cetera. The description of what constitutes each use is contained in very at the very end of the zoning code in the 900s chapters, which I will get to. But the tables identify whether a use is allowed outright allowed with some limitations, allowed if approved through a conditional use review, or prohibited. So for example, in the residential zones, housing would be allowed outright, but a school would be a conditional use review. Um, and it would basically, we would look at, well, I'll get into that in a little bit, but basically, um, a school could be allowed if a conditional use is approved and the uh, school district can apply for a conditional use review. Um, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, the base zones also contain the general development standards for the zone. So this is a summary of a table showing some of the development standards that apply in the single dwelling zones. The base zone development standards are the basic building blocks that determine the form and bulk of development allowed in that zone. The building blocks are standards such as the Florida area ratio, limits, height, setbacks, and maximum building coverage. Development standards vary by zone, and exceptions to the development standards are often allowed through a land use review, which is called an adjustment. So throughout the zoning code, unless the standard states that the adjustment is prohibited, the standard can be adjusted. So the 200 series of the zoning code contain regulations for specific uses and the development that applies across all the base zones. In other words, they supplement the base zones. For example, the regulations for accessory dwelling units and landscaping and screening and parking are contained in the 200s chapters. Um, the inclusionary housing regulations are now a new 200s chapter also because they apply across all of the base zones. Um, the regulations for non-conforming uses are also in the 200s chapters. This is um, an example of a non-conforming use would be like a grocery store um, that's in a residential zone or a house that's in an industrial zone. So oftentimes when you're doing your work, um, either changing the code or changing a map, you, we might be creating non-conforming situations in those cases. Um, so we consider that while we're doing the work. Um, and this is often inevitable when we are planning for the future in an area where development already exists. The 400s chapters of the, of the code contain the regulations for overlay zones. Overlay zones address specific topics or issues that apply in a variety of places in the city, regardless of the base zone. So for example, you'll see the design overlay zone in all of our centers, whether it's um, a mixed use commercial zone or a multi-dwelling zone right next to it. Um, the environmental resources, for example, throughout the city um, have the rules for conserving and protecting the resources um, are the same regardless of what the base zone is. Um, the overlay zone regulations always apply in conjunction with the base zone. So the top map on this slide shows environmental overlay zones and the constraint sites overlay zones. Um, so R7 is the base zone, C stands for conservation, which is one of our environmental zones, and Z stands for the constrained sites overlay zones. Um, the map on the bottom shows the design overlay zone in conjunction with the base zone RM2D, for example, or, or CM2D. This is a list of all the overlay zones that we have, and they are always, the symbols for the overlay zones are always a lowercase, um, lowercase letter. 
the 500s chapters of the um, zoning code um, contains regulations that are tailored to specific areas. Um, and just like the overlay zones, plan districts are applied in conjunction with the base zoning. Plan district regulations apply to, in addition to or modify base zone regulations. And in some cases, they're like mini zoning codes for areas, such as the Central City Plan District, which is very um, intense and long and kind of overwrites most of the base zoning regulations for that plan district. This is an example of a plan district map. In this case, the plan district has specific height limits that override the base zone height limits. Oops. Um, the 600 chapter of the zoning code contains the city's land division regulations. Um, many of our land divisions were done, you know, at the turn of the last century, but people still do come in and divide property into smaller pieces of properties. The 600s, um, are pretty comprehensive and the chapters are grouped in a similar way, similar way that the code itself is into chapters. So the six tens contain the lot size and densities, the 20s, 30s, and 40s contains additional regulations, regardless of zone, kind of like overlay and plan districts. And the 650s contain the infrastructure regulation organized by service. Um, one of the projects we're working on right now is looking at um, land division regulations and making, um, providing for more standard and clear and objective tracks. So you'll be um, looking at a project um, probably towards the end of the year this year that amends some of these rules. Um, the 700s contains all the rules for administering and the code itself, like um, how to implement the code, what is the hierarchy of regulations. If you're a legal buff, which um, Nishant, I assume you are, um, this is probably going to be your favorite zoning code chapter. It contains the rules about reading and understanding the um, zoning code. It also describes the different land use procedure types, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and it details it has details concerning the application requirements and staff level processing and who the review bodies are what the public hearing bodies are, such as the Planning and Sustainability Commission, your code is in um, one of these chapters and how appeals work also. Um, the procedure types for, where are we? Um, so we have many types of land use reviews, which I'll share in the 800s chapter in my next slide. Um, but each land use review is assigned a procedure type and that's in the 700s. So each um, a procedure type is a process through which a specific land use review is decided. The procedure types are called type one, type two, type three, type four procedure types. And all the procedures allow for public input either via written testimony or in person if there's a public hearing. Generally, the higher the procedure number, the more complex the process is. Um, which also, of course, translates to higher costs and more time for the applicant, but translates also to more um, involvement opportunities for the public. So based on state laws, some decisions are made by staff, while others are made by a hearings officer or the design commission or the historic landmarks commission um, or even city council. The planning commission does not make decisions using these procedure types. These procedure types are reserved for quasi-judicial um, reviews for development applications that are site-specific. The, the, um, the types of decisions you make are legislative procedures and don't follow this type one, two, three, four process. Um, so fine. Um, we have the 800s chapters of the zoning code, and this is where all the land use reviews are listed or the most common land use reviews are listed. It assigns which procedure type is required for each type of review. Generally, the bigger the deal, 
the higher the procedure type it's going to be, the, the more impact the project has. In, in other words, if it has a very small impact, it's going to be a lower procedure type. And it also lists the type of appro the approval criteria for common land use reviews. Um, um, when I say land use reviews, we use that term to describe when a a discretionary approval criteria are used as opposed to objective standards. So in Oregon land use law, if a developer comes in the door with a development application, if there are objective standards that can be met um, and they're checkbox type, the planner can review those and approve it over the counter. If they're applying any discretion, then there needs to be an opportunity for public input and that throws them into a land use review. So that's why that final bullet of providing opportunities for public involvement. Um, the land use reviews use approval criteria that sets the bounds for what issues can must be addressed by the applicant and can be considered by the review body or members of the public during the review. If all approval criteria are met, then the review will be approved. A proposal can comply with the criteria with mitigation measures. So sometimes it's yes, this can be approved, but you, you know, um, a new fence and landscaping needs to be provided on the side um, wall to soften the, the look and feel of that building. Um, um, the burden is really on the applicant to show that they've met the criteria that's already been laid out in the zoning code. This is the last chapter of the, of the zoning code, and it's the 900s. It's called general terms, and it provides references for understanding the rest of the zoning code. So it includes definitions, and if a word is not defined, then um, a specific dictionary is used. It describes what the use categories are. And sometimes when new uses come about, BDS really relies on those to see what the characteristics, how often, what type of customers are coming to the site to un unravel and understand what um, characteristics a new use might have. And it describes how things are measured. Um, for example, we recently changed how Florida area ratio was measured um, when we were working on the residential info project because um, we didn't want to count a basement floor area in certain measurements. So in summary, I just wanted to um, really hit home. Hopefully, this is the big takeaway that those comp plan values are translated into zoning code regulations. Um, that zoning consists of a base and an overlay and plan districts. And um, some, some, some properties might only have a base zone. I should reiterate that. Um, all properties do have a base zone, though. Um, uses are either allowed, limited under certain conditions, go through a conditional use, or are just plain out prohibited. We have a set of rules called development standards that regulate kind of the bulk and how the bulk of a building. Um, the words prohibited versus not allowed is very specific in the zoning code. If something is prohibited, you cannot ask or a developer cannot ask for um, an exception to this. If it's not allowed, then generally an adjustment is allowed or um, perhaps um, a, a conditional use would be um, would get to the use allowance. Um, discretionary decisions are done through a land use review versus non-discretionary decisions get approved outright with a building permit. A discretionary review is called a land use review and they have approval criteria and the type of procedure each land use review um, is assigned is based on the impact of that land use review and could be assigned a type one, which is a staff approval. Um, all the way to a type four, um, which, uh, yes, are commission approvals, sometimes city council approvals. And that concludes my orientation to the zoning code. How are you all doing? Can't see anyone, so... <laughs> Sandra, Any questions? I just, I just wanted to, uh, I just have a comment. Um, that was a great summary of the zoning code. Oftentimes, um, 
the zoning code, Title 33, can be um, intimidating um, and extensive, but that was a great run through of, uh, of, of the zoning code. That's all. I like to That's tell new to planners that so can the dictionary. You don't have to read it from end to end and memorize it. It's a reference document. <laughs> the table of contents are very important. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Sandra, thank you so much. I had another comment. I was surprised to learn that our code only goes back to 1991. Well, we have a code from, well, from 1924, we've had many iterations, but in 1991, I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. It was when the big rewrite occurred and it's our, our structure that we currently have. We've had, um, well, Barry wouldn't like me to say this, but I like to say we've had zoning longer than we've had planning in the right. city. <laughs> right. That's yeah. what I was assuming because we have such a legacy of, of planning in the city of Portland. Thank you yes. for that clarification. Yeah, thank you for asking. Okay. okay. Yeah. Chair O'Meara, I was just going to say that I think if there are no other questions from the commissioners, then um, the training portion is is concluded for tonight. And when when you're ready, we're um, we've got our staff person JP. Um, O'Neill is going to be uh, providing the briefing on the parking project. Wonderful. Let's proceed to the briefing. Thank you. All right. All right. Good evening, commissioners. I'm JP McNeil. I'm staff at BPS. I'm on the code development team with Sandra, and I'm here to talk about the parking compliance amendments project. Bear with me for one moment while I pull up my slideshow. Let's see here. Oh, wait. Zoom. <clears throat> Share. This one. Share. Wonderful. Okay, so here we go. Um, so the Parking Compliance Amendments Project, it's a zoning code project. We're making uh, changes to the zoning code to comply with state rules that um, the climate-friendly, equitable communities rulemaking process. So um, this is uh, to bring us into compliance with that. So I'll give you a quick overview of that in a moment, just how we got here. Um, just before we dive in, just so you know what we're changing or proposing to change in the code, um, we're proposing to remove minimum parking requirements um, citywide and to update and simplify the maximum parking requirements in the code and to add some new development standards for large parking lots. I'm going to explain all of that better as we go along. Um, just to add to your Zoning 101 for tonight, just so that we know what we're talking about, um, with new development, there's parking standards that are required. Um, historically, it's minimum parking requirements are part of that. So, for example, a new retail use that um, goes in might have to provide one parking space per 400 square feet of floor area. And then there's also maximum parking requirements that cap the amount of parking that can be um, included. So that same retail use might have a maximum parking requirement of one space per 200 square feet. And then there's also parking lot development standards. So when you go into a parking lot, when you're parking your car and you see the width of the drive aisle and the parking lot landscaping, those were all put in and determined by the development standards for those parking lots. Okay, so before we talk too much about the proposals. I just want to give you a little backdrop on the climate friendly, equitable rules, equitable communities rulemaking, which is a mouthful. And I'm going to refer to as just the climate friendly rules from here on out, just for brevity. Um, and so these rules are adopted by the state last summer in July of 2022. Um, they're 
basically um, rules that apply to local cities, um, land use and transportation rules. The the goal is it's well, it's in support of the goal of um, the greenhouse gas emission reductions that the state has to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by seventy five percent by twenty fifty. And it's focusing in on land use and transportation and the intersection of those, um, the regulations for those, uh, because 38% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state are related to transportation. And this project, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the broader picture of what's in the climate friendly rules, but one piece of it in the is the parking requirements. And so we're talking about that tonight because in these rule changes, because excess parking, it has a negative, it can have negative impacts on housing costs and compact land uses and um, things that uh, we're trying to focus on. So the climate friendly rules components, there's four big pieces to it. The first are the electric vehicle rules. So we've already taken care of that. That was completed and addressed by the EV Ready project that goes into effect later this week, actually on March 31st. And so that basically requires electrical conduit to be included with new multi-dwelling development to support um, future EV charging. Um, number two, that's what we're talking about tonight, updating our parking requirements. Um, the third piece is a transportation land use rule updates. And what this is referring to is updates to the transportation system plan that the Bureau of uh, Transportation, that's under PBOT's purview. So these are updates that PBOT will be doing to the transportation system plan, but it's a later implementation date, probably 2025. And then the final piece is the climate friendly areas. This is a piece that will be taken on by BPS. Essentially what this is talking about is that um, the city needs to identify areas of the city that are designated climate friendly areas, and they are essentially um, up zoned for higher densities and taller buildings that are more supportive of transit or transit supportive densities. And so that also has a later implementation date. Probably we'll be working on that in 2025, but there's a lot more work and study that needs to be done around that. So the piece that we're talking about, the parking updates, um, there's a phased implementation to this part of um, the rules. The first phase went into effect on December 31st. It, I should have thrown, there's 31 days in December. December 31st of uh, last year. There, uh, be, with those rules, it's, the state says that we can no longer have minimum parking requirements within three quarter miles of a light rail station or within half mile of a frequent transit line. And it also uh, eliminates minimum parking requirements for some development types like uh, affordable housing and daycare uses. So those went into effect December 30th, 31st, and that's um, done. And so phase two is what we're talking about tonight. And so these rules have to be in effect by uh, June 30th of this year. And so part of that is codifying those phase one rules. And then the other is the proposals we're talking about, parking minimums, parking maximums, and the development standards that we'll be talking about more. Um, for phase two, the work we're doing now, there's some implementation options that the state gave us around minimum parking requirements. And so the one option is to remove simply remove all minimum parking requirements citywide. There's a second option that allows us to reduce those minimum parking requirements and eliminate them in some areas and keep them in some areas, but there's a lot of um, extra work and strings that go along with that. So we have to look at pricing increases in parking districts and unbundling parking, and there's a lot more requirements in order to do that. And it would take more complex analysis and to get there, and we're in a pretty tight um, time frame here, and it would end up, we'd end up with a more complex code to implement. So for that reason and some other reasons that I'll talk about, we are actually, we're proposing for option one to remove all minimum parking requirements. So another reason why we are uh, we are proposing that is because the the minimum parking removal of minimum parking requirements are in alignment with existing city policy and um, the direction that the city's been taking. So the comprehensive plan has policies about parking management, 
I talk about reducing parking demand and managing supply and limiting the development of new parking spaces to achieve, achieve land use, transportation, and environmental goals. The city also has a climate action plan, and in that climate action plan, it talks about developing a Portland parking strategy that talks about linking parking to mode share requirements. Um, and the city has been moving in a direction away from minimum parking requirements for a long time, starting in the 1980s with the central city plan that removed minimum parking requirements downtown um, to most recently the residential infill project uh, that was uh, went into effect in August of 2021 and that removed minimum parking requirements from single dwelling zones in the city. So it's it's kind of, it's in line aligned with these is just another extension of the work that we've been doing. And then another piece of it is we we did an analysis of where the the areas that in the city that today have no parking minimum requirements and then the areas where this would be implementing new no parking minimum requirements. And so this map shows the areas where there are today, there are no parking minimums. And so the dark blue lines, those are um, the frequent transit lines that have not required um, the buffer around those lines since 2002, there's been no minimum parking requirements. The light blue areas are those new um, phase one state rules where we, we um, are not able to have minimum parking requirements within a half mile of frequent transit or three quarter miles of uh, light rail station. And then the yellow areas, those are the single dwelling air zones that aren't captured by those transit exemptions where there's no parking requirements because of residential infill project. And then this map shows the areas where we're proposing to remove uh, minimum parking requirements. Um, and so if you look at these areas, they're on the edges of the city. And we did an analysis of what types of lands we're looking at here. So you can see the in the upper left, there's Forest Park, there's industrial areas of North Portland, there's Smith and Bybee Lakes, natural area, there's the airport, there's Trying Creek State Park, there's Powell Butte. And so about 90% of the lands in purple are zoned either open space or industrial lands. So because of that and their location, we we expect the impacts to be pretty minimal because it's in areas where there's not a lot of competition for parking anyhow or need for a whole lot of parking. Most of the areas that where folks live and work and shop and eat out are in these areas back here with there are no parking minimums. So we expect there to be pretty minimal impacts. And just a note on minimum parking requirements, removing them doesn't mean that there will be no parking in the future or that developers can't provide parking. It's just that we're not requiring, we're not setting how much they have to have to provide. So an industrial use that's in one of these purple areas in the future, if we remove the parking minimums, they're still likely going to provide some parking for their employees because they're out on the edge of the city and there's probably not great transit out there. Okay. So that's sort of the background backdrop of, of what our proposals are. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the proposals, again, we're talking about removing those parking minimums, updating and simplifying our parking maximums and adding the new development standards for large parking lots. So the parking minimums, this is sort of, this is the bulk of the project is that there, uh, we're removing those minimum parking requirements, references to the minimums in the zoning code, and then removing any exemptions or exemption, exceptions to them um, as well. Um, so that's that's mostly what we are. That's a big piece of this project. And the next is the min maximum parking requirements. So the state rules actually they require cities to adopt parking maximums. Portland is already mostly in compliance with the parking maximums. But, um, the metro has rules for parking maximums, so we already have them in our zoning code. We have for a long time, and so we're just are they basically align with with the uh, or align with the climate friendly rules. So we're making any tweaks we need to there. And then we're also taking the opportunity to simplify some of our parking ratios for maximums that we still have. So there's our zoning code chapter. There's a parking chapter that has the maximums for most of the city, but then there are plan districts, as Sandra was just talking about, some of the plan districts have their own maximums and the numbers are kind of um, weren't always easy to work with. So we're just cleaning that up and simplifying it and making it easier to, to work with and implement 
The last piece uh, comes in two parts, the large parking development standards. Um, so this limits the size of parking lots for large buildings. So uh, think of a big box retailer um, that's 65,000 square feet or larger, the building. This limits the size of the parking lot to the size of the building. It can't be any bigger than that 65,000 foot building. If it's a 100,000 foot building, parking lots limited to 100,000 square feet. And then the final piece are, is the large parking lot green features. And so this applies to parking lots over a quarter of an acre. So that's about 11,000 square feet or 35 parking spaces. And so for those quarter acre or larger parking lots, they need to incorporate either one of either tree shading or solar generation, or they have to meet green energy building requirements, and that's for public buildings only. So what that means is that um, they either have to provide tree canopy that covers 50% of the parking lot within 15 years, or on-site solar panels that provide 0.5 kilowatts per parking space, or for public buildings, that there's green energy building requirements that the state has. And so public buildings either that already meet those standards are exempt from the tree shading or solar, or they have the option of bringing themselves into compliance with that green energy building requirements. And then the last piece is their uh, access ways within a parking lot. So think of the major travel routes through the, through the parking lot. And uh, they must include trees along the edges and pedestrian pathways and things to make it more street-like and less parking lot-like. So those are the rules that we have. So we're the parking minimums, parking maximums, the development standards to bring us into compliance with the climate-friendly rules. Um, and like I said, it's, it ties, it's in alignment with the city goals as well. It's land use planning is climate action. Um, this on the slide here, this is straight from the comprehensive plan talking about providing too much parking and um, the impacts of that. And so we're, this, we're, we're hoping this proposal will help us with the removal of excess parking, which discourages driving since excess parking encourages driving, and um, also removing some opportunity costs of having excess parking. In this photo here, this is um, a project that DPAVE did, a, a nonprofit here in town that rips up pavement in parking lots. And so this was one of their projects that was an underutilized parking lot that's now been turned into a park area and has a playground for kids too. So that's that's the direction that we're moving. Um, and so that's it for the proposals in the background. Our, our timeline here, we're, we're here tonight. We've been doing some community engagement in March and April. Like I said, it's a pretty t it's a tight time frame that we've got here. Um, we'll be back before you on April 11th for a public hearing. Um, and then hopefully getting a recommendation from this body by late April so that we can be moving to city council um, tentatively. We've got city council on June 7th and adoption date of June 30th. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, but we'll also be back in a couple of weeks and we'll hear testimony. So there's more opportunity. Looks like Eli, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you um, for the presentation. and. Um, first off, I'm thrilled that Portland's proposing the option one of just removing parking minimums. And this is the code project with the most net strikeouts of any I've ever seen. So that's awesome. Um, the question I have is um, remembering back to the um, affordable housing project, and I sent an email on this previously, um, where we discovered the universe of conditional use approvals that have parking baked into them. Um, and I just want to confirm that while the state requires us to remove parking mandates from the zoning code, it does not um, make those parking requirements unenforceable or remove them in conditional uses. Um, I think the answer is that the state, that those continuing use restrictions requiring a certain number of parking spaces remain in effect. Um, I want to confirm that. And the other is I'm just curious how big that universe is. I mean, every time I've looked at a conditional use permit, there's, a, you have to have a certain number of parking spaces. Um, I, but I've only looked at like four or six of them or something like that. So I'm just curious, is that a big universe? Um, we did provide one exception with that last project where if you, you can, it's pretty easy ability to um, reduce your parking by half as long as you provide affordable housing on the remaining balance, which is a pretty good, but also very narrow um, exception. And I know a lot of congregations and stuff that, that going through a conditional use modification is a nine month process. It's 
it costs money. It's, it's, it's difficult. So I just want to understand how big that universe is. And even if it's not addressed in this project, which may be too much, too fast, um, I think that it would be nice to have some plan to wind down that kind of those requirements, which I think um, make some properties in the city of Portland that could be redeveloped really nicely, um, effectively kind of ineligible. It makes it creates a barrier to redevelopment of, of projects. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, to your first question, as far as I know, there's nothing in the the climate friendly rules that talks about conditional uses. So it doesn't say that we have to, and we can no longer enforce those minimum parking requirements. Um, we did not touch that with this project. Um, part of the reason is again, where our scope on this and our timeline is, is so focused that anything like this, that would require, and I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the universe of conditional uses are. I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, but it would be a, a large enough use universe that we'd have to do a lot of research and probably some community outreach about um, what that would mean because neighbors sort of have expectations around conditional uses. And so I just, I don't think it would be a, something that we could add to the project, to the scope with our short time frame and the resources that we have for this project. So we haven't, and you're right about the affordable housing. We actually, with the sheltered housing continuum part two also wrapped in similar um, reductions in parking for conditional use sites for outdoor shelters as well. So there are some areas, but it's just, it, it may be a, something to look at in a, in a future project, but it's, we don't have the time or resources to do anything with that for this project. Um, Erica. Um, thank you. That was a, a lot of information in a short period of time. So well <laughs> done. Uh, yeah, definitely a fan of going with option one for um, the parking uh, minimums. I do have questions about the parking maximums and maybe some of it would be best just like followed up with email, but looking at the two tables, there's like the table that, that tells you which standard to follow. And then there's like standard A and standard B. And I couldn't figure out if there were substantive changes. I mean, it seemed like the actual numbers were just like rounding figures, like one per 300 square feet instead of one per 297. But I also couldn't figure out how to figure out what standard you were in for like any residential category. Yeah, it, it, those tables are, they can get confusing. The cleanup that you're mentioning, that was the big piece of it because we're not making big substantive changes to the maximums because we're in compliance with the maximums. And so those changes that you're seeing, they are basically just to make it easier with the, using rounded numbers instead of one per 272, one per 300, just to, for simplification, but we're not proposing a lot of changes. It looks like a lot because those tables have a lot of information in them. And a lot of it was, you use one standard for minimums and one standard for maximums, and it depended, and it was the exceptions and exemptions. And so it, it they're pretty confusing. And so it looks like we're, we're, we're moving a lot and we are, but the, for the maximums, substantively, they're not changing a whole lot. It, well, if I understood it correctly, it also seemed like there was just a blanket exception for single family. Like there wouldn't be a maximum, a parking maximum for single family, residential, attached housing and duplexes. Is that as far? Phil may have helped me with this one. I'm pretty sure that there are no maximums now for um, hang on. Phil is here. He was he was going to jump in if needed. Um, he was the original project manager with this, and he has moved on to the res the regulatory uh, recap. But Phil, can you talk a little bit more about the maximum? Sure. Uh, Phil Namey with Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Um, and uh, JP's correct. The residential infill project removed the minimums uh, requirements for single family. But it didn't address maximums, and neither the climate-friendly uh, rules have maximums for single-family. And we decided not to try to provide rules, partially because it can be very difficult to analyze and address parking maximums for single-family. I mean, if somebody's got a driveway to a garage and they decide to extend the driveway around the back so they can park their trailer or a couple of their vehicles, um, the question is, you know, how much social engineering do we want to do in that case and say you can only have 
three cars on your lot. So I think that the idea was to kind of keep that as simple as possible. Um, obviously, with a lot of the row houses and, and more dense kind of attached house, townhouse development, we generally only see at most one one car per per unit. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I I don't know. I just going back to conserving land and making sure we're not dedicating a bunch of land to parking. I was inclined to want to see single family or to see all residential types be included in this, but I can understand that that's complex to to execute. Um, The last thing that I just noticed when I was reading through this was the transportation demand management plan and how that's something that's required of housing projects with 10 units, regardless of whether or not they're providing parking. And if they don't provide parking, it just doesn't seem like that should be necessary. If we're thinking about like making the process as easy as possible for housing to be developed, why make them go through this um, additional demand, parking demand management process if they're not providing any parking. I feel like that should just be an exception. It seems circular to me that we're saying like, by getting rid of parking minimums, we're strengthening transit. But then if you're doing a housing development that doesn't have any parking, you still have to like prove how you're not overburdening the transit system or something. It's a little funny. I don't know if that it makes sense to you what I'm getting at, but it it does make sense. I don't Phil, did you have what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, and this is actually a requirement that was that's coordinated with PBOT. And so it's it's something that we work with PBOT and and the piece that we're taking out actually was currently if you're far from transit, you don't have to do transportation demand management. So actually if you're close to transit, whether you're providing parking or not, you have, and you're doing more than 10 units, you have to do a TDM. But PBOT has set up a program. They have sort of a, a basic check sheet science standards tracked, or you can propose something more substantial. But um, the check sheet one is sort of, I, I would compare it to like when a, somebody's doing erosion control mm-hmm. and they can sign a sheet and saying, you know, yep, I'll put, I'll put, you know, uh, erosion fencing around there. I'll put bio bags by the storm sewer and this, and you're done. It's kind of a similar thing. It's like I will provide opportunity for residents to get bus passes. I can do, you know, two other things and I'm done. And we didn't, once again, we didn't feel that uh, we were in a position to start making policy decisions to change that. Uh, I do believe that PBOT is looking at the TDM program and potentially updating that as part of some of their other work that they're doing with the, the vehicle miles traveled reduction and things. So it's quite possible that that stuff will change in the next couple of years. Uh, but we didn't want to uh, mess with it a little bit. The only thing we wanted to d- determine was since we weren't uh, figuring out what was close and what was far from transit anymore, we just struck out that language which really only impacts, I think it only impacted somewhere between eight and 10% of the projects. So there's about eight to 10% of the projects that were far from transit that didn't used to have to do a VMT that maybe would now. Thank you. I did have a, a quick question and it's just to help frame this in my mind. As you spoke about the large parking lot um, sort of provisions of this, I'm assuming that's parking related to housing and business development as opposed to somebody saying i just want to open up a parking lot commercial independent of any other development does well uh, like a commercial parking lot yeah i think the question seems to be about um whether it's like a more of a freestanding it's a primary use the parking lot is a a commercial commercial parking yeah um i the large parking phil does that address i'm Commercial parking, I don't believe it is covered under that. I would have to look and see it because the, the one piece where it says that the parking can't be larger than the the floor area, I've, obviously that's that's accessory to the building. Uh, I think if somebody were to just propose a parking lot not associated yeah. with any use and if it was over a quarter acre, they would have to then uh, meet those uh, shading and, and solar requirements. Uh, it's not something we've seen a lot of. Uh, generally, uh, uh, parking's been proposed as part of other development. Um, 
In fact, probably more often what we see is parking lots getting converted into buildings. Uh, so, but I think if it, that quarter acre provision would likely apply, uh, whether the parking's related to a building or not. And just to interject here with our previous um, training, um, those words primary use and accessory use are used often in the zoning code. So I, I, I think commissioner, you're talking about when it's a primary use not associated with any other use um, that the use category, we call it commercial parking and commercial parking is not allowed in many zones as a primary use already, just the use itself. Um, but many times it's accessory to housing or accessory to retail sales and service or accessory to office. Um, question, um, thank you for this. And also kudos for uh, eschewing acronyms. I saw, I saw what you did there multiple times. Um, <laughs> a, a confession, I have not yet read the amendments, but I'm curious, are tree canopy requirements only for new parking? It's for new parking or adding a quarter of, of an acre. So if you're adding a quarter acre, the new portion would have to meet okay, that. So it doesn't like. No. It, ah, we, yeah. We, it, <laughs> it doesn't. It, yeah. The, the old, it would be difficult if you're thinking about for a, a sm especially for a smaller parking lot and you're having they'd have to put in pedestrian and it re basically reorganize the whole parking lot. So it's just applies to new if you're over adding more than a quarter of an acre. I, I, I go by Eastport Plaza <laughs> multiple times a day. Okay. So <laughs> one, one caveat on that, you know, the, these standards that we're, we're putting in to kind of comply with the state rules and Department of Land Conservation Development's climate friendly rules. You know, they're, they're actually kind of adding a layer to some things we already have. So actually existing parking lots, if you are, if that parking is part of a shopping center or office complex, and if they are doing uh, a bunch of upgrades and tenant improvements and they go over that non-conforming threshold, and if we find out that that parking lot is deficient in landscaping, if we find out that they don't have the pedestrian walkways to the street, um, they do have to spend a certain percentage, basically 10% of the project costs to bring those standards up to compliance or as close as that value would take them to. So we do already have a lot of provisions in our code that allow or that require parking lots to be upgraded uh, incrementally with development. A brief question, uh, first shape. JP, thanks for the succinct uh, presentation. I, um, as you're going through uh, the presentation, I um, remembered um, that sometime last year, just for the legal background on this, there was a lawsuit that was filed by several cities and I think a county as well um, with the Oregon uh, Court of Appeals attempting to invalidate the state rules. Um, are we tracking that? Um, we're tracking that. We're moving forward. That is a lawsuit. There is a lawsuit um, that's moving ahead. Um, we're tracking it, but we're also moving forward with it because we don't know what's going to happen with that. And like I had already said, that it's the the things that we're making, the changes we're making, they're in alignment with our our larger goals, anyways. So we're not joining a lawsuit or a part, you know, I, I mean, I can't speak for the city council, but right. this is, you know, it's sort of in alignment for with what we're doing anyhow. And we have to move ahead because we don't know what's going to happen with the lawsuit. And even I know that in some places like Med the city of Medford has joined that lawsuit, but the city of Medford planning department is also moving ahead in implementing these rules. So, right. so, you know, we still have to do it. And yeah. Right. No, that makes sense. And I think the, the last Last thing I read about that was they they sought for a stay, uh, basically a pause on implementing the regulations pending judicial review. And I think the court denied it, but they haven't ruled on the merits. So the case is still right. pending, but right. jurisdictions are still. Able right. to, OK, I just yeah, just it's good to just track for background and context. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Keeping an eye on it, but we're moving ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I have a um, a question and, and possibly a little bit of comment, but uh, thank you so much for the presentation as well. Um, I was just wondering if um, if there's been uh, any 
um, like, uh, has, has anyone like looked into like the comments or like, you know, how people have like kind of uh, commented on the parking situation? Um, and uh, I was also, I, I kind of looked at the, um, when we had the other, the earlier presentation, there was maybe one person that had said something on there. Now, um, anecdotally, you know, I kind of told some of, some of my neighbors, you know, that I was, you know, going to this meeting, we were going to be talking about parking and they were kind of blowing up about, you know, well, we need parking. We need to think about transportation first. So I'm just wondering if like the message that is getting out to like everyday people is if they're understanding what is actually happening. Um, I think it's great. I mean, I want to get rid of you know, as much parking as possible. Right. <laughs> um, uh, but I think a lot of people are maybe confused about how the city is going about dealing with parking. And they may be blaming the city for some of the inconvenience of like putting out their trash cans, you know, for pickup because there's not enough room on the street, you right. know, because there's so many cars parked on the street. Um, and I just would hate to, you know, have confusion or the lack of understanding, you know, from folks who live in like dense areas uh, um, or who live like next to, you know, fourplexes that are coming into their communities without and blaming it, you know, on the city making these these right. these choices. So I'm just wondering if that's been tracked at all or if, you know, or if there's been any type of like public campaign to like try to you know, diffuse right. <laughs> some of the potential anger that could come out of this. So we've been meeting with the, some of the neighborhood folks and the district coalitions. Um, and there, as you said, there's one comment um, that's in the testimony reader right now. And I've heard some, some folks that weren't, uh, I think there's a misunderstand. There is some misunderstanding on the one hand, because some of the, I've heard some comments and concerns, but in terms of specific to this project, the comments and concerns are a little diffused because we're not changing that. So where most of the denser areas today, they already don't have parking requirements. We're not making any changes there. So it doesn't make any, might not make anybody any happier, but we're not making any changes. The places that we're actually at this point making the changes are in open space areas and industrial zones. So that's, it may not be uh, exactly uh, the most satisfying response, but it is the the way it is. And also the, the state, most of the places that where the changes are happening that are in denser areas, it's because the state is mandating us to do that. So there's, there's a little bit of that, but uh, there are certainly some, um, I've heard more from areas that are actually less dense where folks are a little bit more concerned about it than when I've been meeting with the, with the neighborhood folks in denser areas, I haven't heard as much. And I think that's because that has it's already been in place in a lot of the places where there's denser development already, and so it's not really a change. Okay, I just wanted to I want to just hear you say that because, like I said, I I, I have a feeling that I may have some neighbors watching this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, just to, so that they can be able to like may, maybe clarify with their neighbors and friends yeah. about like what's what's happening that it's you know they're not confused so yeah thanks for the question right. any additional questions we are over time just slightly it's an important discussion as a reminder we'll be back we'll be back in two weeks with the hearing so any questions you can hold them to then or shoot me an email if you're interested yeah can I just add two observations? One is that um, you're right to point out, Michael, that parking is touchy and people get very emotional about it. And um, we could certainly expect that at the hearing um, in a couple of weeks. Um, JP did a good job in the staff report talking about the community engagement that has already occurred um, and what occurred at the state level. Um, and he added that in because there have been conversations at the state level. This is a quicker project than what we would normally do on our on our end at the planning side. But like he said, we have a deadline of June um, 
end of June. Um, during the residential info project, which um, basically allows the, um, change the rules to allow fourplexes on all lots. We had a lot of conversations about parking and whether we should change the parking rules. Prior to that, it was one parking space per dwelling unit. Um, so a fourplex would have required four parking spaces. Um, we all recognize that that wasn't where we wanted to go and so much pavement and impervious surface on the lot. Um, there was also a lot of talk about um, having a parking one parking space on the lot um, and the curb cut uh, eliminates a street parking space. So it was basically privatizing, pr providing a parking space on site privatizes what could be shared by everybody on the street. Um, so that was one of the big considerations of removing minimum parking um, in the, all the single dwelling zones, which makes that map a lot more blue that that JP shared also. So yeah, we understand people's concerns um, for sure. And, um, and like JP said, it doesn't mean that developers can't provide parking. It just means that we're not going to insist on parking being provided. Thank you. Sorry, very briefly. Um, I also, um, I also really appreciate the analysis of um, the relationship of removal of parking minimums to um, uh, to supporting more affordable housing. Um, that that a lot of times, you know, those those parking spaces they have cost because that is land and land costs and and that rolls up into the the cost of a of a home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take it as a sign. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. If there are no additional questions or comments, I think we are at a point of adjournment unless there's any additional announcements from staff. No, uh, thank you, Chair O'Mara. I just wanted to apologize to JP. I would, I'm just going to attribute to the lateness of the hour that I misstated his last name. So forgive me for that, JP. I wanted to. I was going to let. Wanted it slide. to apologize to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but otherwise, no other announcements, and we appreciate your time very much. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Oh, I, I did. I thought it was funny, but you're not the first person to call me O'Neill, McNeil.